School Committee meeting. Hello. Um, I'll call the meeting to order and uh, I will need to get a motion uh, to move into executive session. Can you read this? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. The uh, chair will entertain um, the motion. Oh. Language. Move to go in. Uh, that language? Yep. Mm -hmm. Move to go into executive session to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non union personnel and to discuss the deployment of security personnel, personnel or devices or strategies with respect thereto. I have determined an open meeting will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and to reconvene an open session. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Roll, call. Press. Okay, roll call, sorry. Uh, Keith? Aye. Tara? Yes. Paul? Yep. Father? Yes. Oh, Tamara. Oh. Tamara, we're doing a roll call to go into executive session. Sure, Tamara. Aye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, we will reconvene in open session in about, um, in less than 30 minutes? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll call uh, the meeting back to order, open the session. Um, and first item is adjustments to the agenda. I have one that I'd like to request, which is to move up public comment period uh, to before the presentations. Are there any other requested adjustments? Uh, just so we can go back into executive session at the end of the meeting. Okay, yes, at the end we'll go back into executive session. And we'll not reconvene in open after cool. that? Cool. Okay. All right, so then that will move us to public comment period. We have uh, Linda Castronovo here to present uh, information on ranked choice voting that has uh, edible um, props that go with it. I would like to ask, typically, uh, um, public comment is three minutes for our policy, but I'd like to ask uh, whether the committee would consider five minutes for this presentation uh, and any other public comment that there may be. Is that okay? Do we yes. need to vote on that? It's an exception to policy. Select. Okay, yes. so all in favor? Uh, Aye. I'm sorry, can you get a first and a second? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm motion sorry. to extend public motion comment. Motion to extend public comment. Second. Five minutes. Okay. Second. Okay. You seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Great. Right. Linda. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. I'm the person who sponsored a ward article to um, bring ranked choice voting to our town meeting. So on the annual meeting on May 3rd, the, um, our, anyone who shows up anyway will have a chance to cast their, their ballot um, for or against this idea. So I wanted to make sure that as many people as possible and have the understand what ranked choice voting is. So, you can raise your hand if you've ever heard of ranked choice voting. <laughs> and keep it, oh, so only two, so that's good. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it. Um, ranked choice voting, and you have a sample ballot. You have actually two sample ballots in front of you. It's a change to the way that we vote. So right now, when you vote, when you vote um, in an election, you cast your ballot for a single candidate. And with a ranked ballot, you can rank the candidates in order of preference. So you vote for a first choice, and then you make a series of backup choices for second and third choice. And what this does is solves some big problems. That many times when there are more than two candidates running for an office, the winner never receives majority support. And so using this ranked choice voting method, you can guarantee that the winner of the election has um, broad-based majority support. So you might ask, Oops, this is another, you have this other sample of a ballot. So the simple ballot, the candy ballot, is just a column system. You can just rank a first choice. You can, on this um, example of candidacy, a second choice. And then in another sample ballot, you would have all the candidates listed in each column. And you make a one mark in your first choice column, another mark in your second choice, third choice, and so on. So people say, oh, we'll solve some problems. Let's, how does it work? So I wanted to give you two examples. I may not have time to show all of the, both of the examples, but I can show you um, this example with your favorite candy. <laughs> and this, these ballots were collected over a, few, a number of different meetings. I did it for simplicity's sake that the first thing that happens in a ranked ballot or ranked um, 
choice voting election is that all the first choice votes are tallied. And so that's what you see here. These, um, these are the ballots. There are 14 first choice votes for Snickers. There are seven for Twix, eight for Milky Way, and six for Rolo. We did have quite a few right ends. And so the first thing that happens is you count how many ballots total. We had 48 ballots. So for a single winner election, the winner has to receive a majority of the votes, which is 50% plus one. So half of 48 is 24, and another one, the winner has to have 25 <coughs> to win. You can see in our first choice votes, Snickers is ahead, but they don't have majority support, which means that more than half the people voted against Snickers as, a, as their favorite candy. So if in, a, in the way our election works now, Snickers would win. Maybe sometimes it happens that it's the same, and sometimes it is. So on our write-ins, oh, and some of the elections, some of the ballots were mismarked, and we can go over those at different, but very few actually end up being mismarked because ranking is something we do naturally. I always say, like, how many people really walk out of the ice cream store when they're out of your favorite flavor <coughs> without your backup choice, right? Or you go to a restaurant, you go to go out to eat, your favorite restaurant's closed, you go to your next restaurant. So in the in our write-in situation, we had actually quite a few write-ins, but there was only one for dark chocolate, and that second choice was Rolo. So we'll put it under the Rolo. This second choice was for Twix. This was the peppermint patty. Second choice was Rolo. Second choice was Rolo. Um, second choice was Twix. Second choice is Twix. So you can see here how a second choice could surpass this first choice, this first winner. Here's another Twix. Oh, here's some Snickers, second choice for Snickers. Snickers, Snickers, Twix, and Rolo. So now what we're going to do is, um, in the second round, we retally. So we're going to add four to Rolo. So they have ten. Milky Way still has eight. <coughs> those in there. We're going to add two, four, five, six to Twix. And Snickers has four more. So on the second round, we add we total these up. Still eight. Still ten. 18, 13, 8, and 10, stickers still does not have a majority. So this is the really interesting thing that happens. Now we're going to remove the candidate. We're going to eliminate the candidate that has the least amount of first choice votes. So Milky Way gets eliminated. And we're going to look and see where, who they put theirs for their second choice. So there's a Twix. This Milky Way voter didn't list a second choice. So this person disenfranchised themselves. They have taken themselves out of the out of the voting <coughs> intention, silencing their own their own voice. Here's Twix. 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 Linda, I'll have to call time here too. Snickers, okay. Snickers up. and Snickers. Um, but so you can see how this would happen. So now Snickers has 18 plus 3. They're at 21. And we would eliminate them the next candidate. Gotcha. Okay. Linda, well, let me ask you too. I um, appreciate you presenting the information. I understand you have a couple, at least one other presentation coming up, uh, Select Board. We're, I'm going to speak at the Select Board. I'm going to speak at the Mothers Club. I'm happy to come to anybody's house and do the presentation. The candy balloting is kind of fun. Um, there is a, an interesting um, thing that happens when there are multiple candidates the multi-winner election, and I have a, I have some slides about that as well, which might be of interest at some point. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Well, appreciate it. Thank you. We always enjoy having clarity on ballot items and town meeting items, warrant items. Thank so you very much. Just to be clear, you're asking for our support if this were some as a new way to do town meeting. Well, every person who comes to town meeting will be will have a chance to vote on this item. So you're educated. Mm -hmm. And I think that people don't tend to vote for things they don't understand. And so really what I want to do is educate people about what the, what the change would mean and how it would create 
um, a more representative, for one thing, it creates better representation. Um, it's been shown to improve the num increase the number of candidates that run for office. It increases the voter turnout. Um, and I just, I'm convinced, and, it's, and we have evidence from many cities and towns across the country, almost four million people across America use ranked choice voting for the municipal elections already. And more candidates run, more people vote, and people are more engaged in their town government. And I think that would be good for our town. I misspoke calling it a ballot item. It's a warrant article. It's a warrant for article. upcoming town meeting exactly. mm -hmm. that, would, um, that is presented for all town elections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at David, like, correct? <laughs> it'd be for all elected offices. Of all elected offices. Well, whether be, they have a single candidate or multiple running the way, it's, the way it's written now, and correct me if I'm right, is that it's, uh, mm -hmm. that it's not a way of changing the way we vote on the budget or on board articles. Right. I mean, there are 44 elected officials in our town, and in the last five years, there have been only eight contested elections. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, I, this is a way to get, get more people involved, and, a, and I think a lot of times people don't run for office because they're happy with the leadership and they don't want to take or have a, a chance of siphoning off votes from someone who they really like serving the town. And right choice voting is a way to make sure that people can run and they won't split votes, they won't be a spoiler candidate. It could, really produces fair outcomes. Thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate it. Is there any other public comment for today? Okay, then we will move on to presentations and discussion items. School state safety and security recommendations and next steps. So after our executive <laughs> session on the deployment of uh, school safety and deployment of security devices, we will take the recommendations from Hadley PD, do some research on our end, invest it, uh, integrate their priorities in the capital plan, bring the capital plan back before the school committee at a regularly scheduled April meeting. Um, additional items we will revisit again in a future executive session. Okay. Can I just say, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Nixon, uh, the officers and Chief Mason are doing a great job. Really super appreciate their support. Thank you. Thank you so much for the feedback. Yeah. We appreciate them uh, diligently walking through this information with us as well, mm -hmm. with you know, uh, also helping guide us through priority items and, and uh, <coughs> other topics that they have presented. It helps us understand what, um, you know, what we should be examining more closely. Okay, um, Special Education Stabilization Fund. That's our next topic. And I'm listed on that with you, David, so. <laughs> I think, um, so we uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk last week at Triboard um, outside of, of the open meeting here, but uh, I had asked all of us to think about any questions we may have on um, the stabilization fund, and it may help, as you did in that Triboard meeting, to frame the two, we have two warrant articles that reference the stabilization fund. If you could help frame that for us, I think we had some questions just about how that would work. Certainly, would it be helpful if I stood and, and talked a little bit? Of we can, and we can, we can yep. turn, excuse me, Mr. Beck, do you mind turning the projector off so when David's that's, standing? That's fine, I can. We're just covering the front. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The basic concept is, is that we want to produce budgets, and our budget project, uh, projections are 18 months out. We want to produce <coughs> budget projections which are that reduce risk, minimize risk, or manage risk, and improve our clarity and accuracy in how we present that budget. And whenever we have a budget which has a, a certain amount of risk, and when I say risk, I don't mean risk in terms of hazard, but it just having an obligation which is non-negotiable show up halfway through the, the fiscal year that we need to fund. And so we want to make sure that our budgets have the capacity to fund something that may happen during the, the middle of the year. So for example, the health insurance line item, uh, so we pay for health insurance for uh, all of our employees who are eligible for that. And we have, um, we have three types of uncertainties when putting together that budget. One, 
at any time somebody may have some sort of qualifying event, they get married, they have a baby, something that changes them from say a family plan to uh, from an individual plan to a family plan. And then we have the open enrollment period in every February. So it's at that point everybody who is eligible for for um, health insurance can change their plan. They can go from an HMO to an indemnity plan or they can change from single to family. And so that's another kind of uncertainty that goes into that, into that budget. And then formally, it's no longer the case. We're finally getting out of this. Formally, the health insurance calendar year did not line up with the fiscal calendar year. So we had the, the last quarter of the fiscal year, April, May, uh, April, May, June, where we actually had no projections at all as to what those health insurance costs may be. We generally had a sense that they would rise, but we didn't know if that was a 5% or 10% or even That's higher delicious. rise. So in the past, we had to make these, this budget with, uh, with generous uh, margins for the uncertainties that we did not foresee and had to manage, and we're obliged to pay if, it, if they came about. So um, at one, and so at some times uh, I'm returning over $100,000 back to the general fund at the end of the fiscal year because we had taken too conservative a projection of where, where the budget was going to go. And uh, you know, that made people unhappy. That's $100,000 that you can use for other purposes, for other productive purposes. So um, in a sense, the school budget is the same. You put together a budget which projects out 18 months what you think that your costs are going to be, but you have to build into that a certain amount of risk management. People coming in mid-year that have uh, educational obligations, and these people deserve an education same as anybody else, that we have to pay for, you have to budget for. And so I'm trying to come up with a way, and this is open for discussion, we could repackage this in any way that you would like, uh, for a way that we can set up some sort of stabilization fund which would be accessible by the vote of the school committee at any point during the middle of the fiscal year to uh, manage uh, students being placed within the district that you have to pay additional funds for, whether that be Smith Vocational or some other that <coughs> needs some sort of support. So we were thinking about transferring money from the stabilization account into a special stabilization account and then appropriating from that stabilization account a sum of money which would be available to the school committee to be used during the middle of the fiscal year. Uh, and that is in a nutshell what we're talking about. Still an item for discussion with the select board, presented it to Dr. McKenzie, uh, we talked about it with Chris Desjardins, uh, and Heather Klesch was there to see the discussion at the Tri-Board. That was terrible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, right now I've written this up as two articles because it's performing two financial functions. I always like to combine articles wherever you have a like uh, um, uh, object in mind, so I might combine this into one article for presentation on a town meeting board. And if we're ready to do it at uh, the annual town meeting, so, so, so be it. If not, then do it up for some other later town meeting. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay. At this point? The proposal that is for not to exceed 2% of the annual, annual budget, is that right? That's school spending? Mm -hmm. No, there's no percentage uh, requ uh, requirement here. This is to be the move they I oh, is this the law? There, there is no law. So yeah, so the, the law is level. something that you brought to my attention. That would require a, a vote of both the select board and the school <coughs> committee to take off, take uh, money out of there. This, uh, the select board has said that they have no interest in participating in uh, educational choices or educational policy. They want to put that in your hands where it rightly belongs in my mind. So that law there is not something that we would follow, or we would follow the law, but we would not choose this particular law in order to set up this particular stabilization fund. Okay. 
Well, I just had a question about that in, in general. So it says in the law, it says that in order to transfer the funds, there would have to be a majority of vote by a school committee and what other legislative body. But that says without further appropriation for un unanticipated or budgeted costs. So how how would we would we would have to have support of select board and majority school board in order for this to. So think, think of this as a, as a building project or a special project uh, like any other, any other project. We go to town meeting, we raise funds, we identify people who are, are responsible for the expenditure of that funds, whether that be the library committee or the select board or the police department, and then they go out and they spend those funds. Um, that's what I'm trying to set up, is something as easy as that. And where do these funds come from originally to pay the engine this? The original source of money would be from our general stabilization fund. We have over $2 million in that, so we can afford to give uh, some money for that purpose. So it comes from the town stabilization fund? Yep. Not your money. It becomes your money, but it's not originally from you, your money. Just in the town, special, uh, the town stabilization fund, you have a select board vote as a policy on that, that it's a uh, minimum 10% of operating budget of the previous fiscal year. Right. That's correct. And then free cash is the same 10% reserve. So these are two. So is it combined? Can you just clarify that for me? It's just stabilization. stabilization. Yeah, it's the only one that we targeted as a percentage is stabilization. Mm -hmm. And then free cash, we basically said that we didn't want to ever spend it down below a certain dollar figure. So uh, that's certainly. not tied to a percentage. That's a minimum dollar amount. <coughs> Stabilization is 10% of operating. So roughly 1.8 million, probably. Yeah, something like that. that. Exactly. Is what it would be for right. fiscal year 18 based on fiscal year 17's yes. uh, operating budget. Yes. Okay. The free cash, is, uh, we're not supposed to spend that down below 75,000. May I ask one more question about this? May I, just yeah. on the uh, stabilization side, you you said roughly two million. You may have been rounding. I don't expect you to to pull exact figures out. I'm not trying to to go there. I just was wondering. So if for some reason that it was determined that um, that the schools might already have an effective way of managing contingencies or unexpected expenses in special education, and the town had an excess of its policy, let's say stabilization was up around 12 or 13 percent, would that then allow the town to create some other, utilize those funds for one-time expenses? I know you can't use stabilization for operating, but could you use them for one-time capital investments that the town might need? Yes, so the law changed not too long ago that we can set up these special stabilization accounts for special purposes. We do it with our capital budget already. We have a capital stabilization account, which was seeded with money that was equivalent to our uh, meals tax in annual income, which is around $300,000 per year. We're not making that, that commitment uh, in current years, but originally that's how it was set up. So, um, so this would be yet another special stabilization fund once we set it up, it would be drawn down, and we haven't talked about how to replenish it. But it's still something that we're working on in terms of, in terms of what would be a viable way to sustainably support that stabilization fund over time. Can, can I ask one more question? Can I just make a clarifying comment, mm -hmm. though? Um, just to be clear, just in case anyone who's watching at home, mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to say that the current select board and I think I can say it for the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. would have a visceral reaction to the spend down stabilization account. So the only reason that this discussion has been taking place, and again, there, there has not been a full discussion on the part of the Select Board and Finance Committee, because quite frankly, motive, if the school committee says, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a really you know, bad idea, we can support it, then, then it's not something we can carry forward with. But the idea is that you're really swapping one reserve fund for another. Um, the concern is that, yes, we're above and beyond this 10% mm -hmm. mark that we have, but as our budget grows, that required amount is going to grow too. So you have to kind of figure out what's the trajectory of when you're eventually going to yeah. head up and then we need to put ourselves in a position of having to add to stabilization. Yeah. So I think when this policy was put in place, we all looked at each other and kind of said, okay, we're not looking to kind of carve that off and start spending the mm -hmm. excess. 
Um, but I think it's a little bit of a different conversation if you're talking about still maintaining some sort of a reserve. Yes, then next so may I ask yep. a question? May I ask a question? And this will help too. Uh, my question may have implied, and so I need clarification. The policy stated mm -hmm. as a floor for stabilization, not to go below 10% of previous years operating or existing years operating. Correct. It would have to be previous. Yeah. So, um, but there's no ceiling on stabilization. So you're not required to bring it to that 10%. No. You can have more than the 10%. No. And in the spirit of my other question, which ultimately this is not at all my decision, it's a school committee decision, but the spirit of my other question was, if there were, because I know the school committee, the school department has a vested interest in cooperating with all the needs of the town, mm -hmm. if there were um, other departments or needs that the townspeople had determined were a priority, swapping one stabilization for another could potentially be a possibility. Because you're saying there are, mo there are various things that one can set up stabilization for. Mm -hmm. Capital, equipment, as mm -hmm. long as they're not recurring costs. I think is it, um, actually Chris might know this better, uh, transportation maybe, is that another one that other school districts have used? No, I actually, I actually don't know. So I can tell you the law is yeah. really, really clear. Yeah. I mean, I know you're talking about doing something that yeah. the law is very clear. It's special education <coughs> stabilization. If it's called that, it is specifically for out of district costs associated with special education mm -hmm. and said transportation costs. Yep. Smith Volk would not fall into what the law is here. Correct. Other towns have done that differently. Yep. They voted when they, at a, a long time ago, how they voted to put it in the, the school operating, mm -hmm. other towns pay it out of the town side. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying there aren't, as you said, on the municipal finance side, there could be other ways of setting up special ed stabilization, uh, excuse me, stabilization. But mm -hmm. special ed stabilization is clearly delineated in the statute. Yeah, I, I've titled this educational contingency stabilization account. That may be inartful, but mm -hmm. it uh, broadens the use of the stabilization account away from mm -hmm. just strictly the spent issues you just raised. Yeah. Really, I'll, and to maybe to your point, we're trying to get a little creative here and figure out is there a way to manage our balance sheet as a town and put these dollars to use in some sort of effective way as opposed to kind of every man for himself trying to, to protect mm -hmm. ourselves. And, and I think your example was a great one with the health coverage. Never on the town would we want to be in a position where we couldn't properly appropriate funding for people in need of health coverage because they made a choice that we couldn't control on July 1st. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to think about the situation with the schools mm -hmm. um, with this being something, you know, we're always kind of trolling to see what best practices are mm -hmm. elsewhere, and, and David uncovered this in the, some conversations, so that's why it's coming to the table. Yeah. Very open-minded for other ideas. I'm, I'm right. just hoping we can find a way to start trying to figure out some longer-range planning on this. And maybe just a final point of clarification. Mm -hmm. um, the example that you gave with health insurance, excellent example. That is something that in order to control for the unforeseen it's, as you said, sometimes you end up returning about $100,000 to the town. In, in oh, we did that once. One time. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, returning that. <laughs> I will say that um, although it's logical to assume right now, that for the past few fiscal years, that there would be an analogous situation happening in special education and the school department budget, that we would conservatively and prudently be over budgeting in the event that something could happen. We have historically under budgeted. Mm -hmm. And because the school committee has a sound school choice policy, as a matter of fact, I think you were the chair when that was created, mm -hmm. um, that we have been able to manage those contingencies with that. But I, I just want to clarify that for people who are watching that there hasn't, we have not historically, the data demonstrate clearly that we are not over budgeting in um, our special education, even though we have encountered unexpected expenses. But the school choice reserve policy has. Um, prevented us from having a <coughs> And I think to add to that, when we've had to, when we've been pressed to um, look at those funds and funding more out of that for the budget, mm -hmm. we've, we've been able to do that while not, you know, going past what our policy says we need to retain. Um, I think the thing I'm struggling with, and, and this is not, you know, this is just more for me personally. When I hear, you know, the needs of the town and the needs of other departments, we just sat with, you know, police and, and knowing that fire, they, they all have needs, and those are identified needs. And I raised this last week that 
here we are saying, well, let's carve out some money for something that isn't yet an identified need. It's a what if, it's a contingency <coughs> plan, you call it managing the uncertainties. I totally get that, but it's, it's hard for me to reconcile that as a priority when compared to the needs that are identified needs from these other departments. But remember what we're talking about again is a balance sheet item, so we're talking about a stable, stabilization fund that's a reserve. And many of the other needs that we have are, involve ongoing operating. So a one-time spend down or carve out from effectively cash mm -hmm. doesn't resolve the issue. And so never do we want to, and, and similar to the school choice argument, never do we want to put ourselves in a situation where we're taking one-time money and then trying to you know, figure out where to fund the, um, the ongoing operations that have been created from that. Mm -hmm. So that's why we haven't gone to that when we're talking about police, um, fire personnel. In those things. So one of the follow-up questions as well, and that, that helps to clarify, you know, the difference between the mm -hmm. two and, and what we're talking about here is not being an operating budget item, but the, as you said, it really is a contingency stabilization fund. Um, the lines as far as what the, the amount would be appropriated to that would be, are currently blank in the warrant. Can we talk about what is being considered or is that something that you need us to advise on or let me let me just throw some numbers out so that and this is not backed up by any conversation i've had with any of the finance committee members or with the select board but if we're talking about thirty thousand dollars so let's stop talking you know let's find something else to do with it. It make a difference uh if we're talking a hundred thousand dollars then that's that's money that may make a difference and may be worth talking about so I would be looking at a number of about $100,000 or perhaps more. And Chris, can you remind us what, given our current policy, what we are currently, um, per policy, retaining in school choice, not dipping below ballpark? Sure, you need to maintain the amount of the grants that we receive. So in the budget summary for mm -hmm. FY19, that's roughly 341000 that's your minimum. That's your kind of work for policy. <coughs> and currently, the school choice balance is seven million. Yeah, no, because that's already committed. You'll have an ending balance. Our projected ending balance <coughs> in FY18 will be roughly five hundred fifty-five thousand um, dollars. We have additional revenues coming in, and special ed increment that we projected in FY19. Our the budget that we presented, uh, that we reviewed with the finance subcommittee, uh, has. Um, Seven hundred twenty thousand dollars of school choice being applied in FY19, and uh, we bring your projected balance down to three forty four. So still above your policy floor, just above the policy floor. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what other questions? Molly, well, you said that the select board and finance committee had you had a chance to fully weigh in on it, but have you discussed it at all? Is it just the general sense? Uh, honestly, I, mean, I don't know. Amy can speak for the finance committee at the select board level. Um, there was really, I recall, kind of like you know, five thousand foot discussion on this, um, and I and I can tell you right now, as we're sitting here, I imagine there would not be unanimity on the part of the select board in terms of supporting this or not. But that could change once we have a full discussion and know how the school committee feels about it. So. Mm -hmm. and the finance committee hasn't really, um, right now we're going through trying to balance the budget. Um, it, it, we thought this might be a way to work with the schools, but yet get our budget to balance. Um, so I think it depends. I, I think if we can get, you know, it's not something we're looking for, you know, we don't, we're not, looking to spend any part of the stabilization but if we need to to balance you know it, it might be something to consider because it is it, it, it is just for emergencies it's for the risk and it's just going from one stabilization to another so it's something to that we're considering I'm I'm just curious if there's if accounts like this have happened in other in other towns if there's any 
evidence of like what that's done for like school budgets down the road, like longer term. Mm -hmm. Like th we they know that we have that there's this money that's can be dipped into for contingency. Has that negatively affected the school budgets yeah, in other towns? Mm -hmm. That's a fair question. I don't have an answer off the top of my head for you. I can get it for you. Um, contact mm -hmm. MASC, find the towns and towns special ed state organization, and how the uh, school committee chairs report on long term impact. Mm -hmm. So I'm about to ask some basic questions <coughs> to wrap my head around this opportunity. Um, if we uh, ever needed to, if we needed to expend more than we budgeted for, right now we dip into our school choice mm -hmm. dollars. Um, with this set aside, this carve out, if, as you will, um, we would continue to do that. Mm -hmm. And in the unlikely event that we uh, got to a certain mm -hmm. um, floor, mm -hmm. I guess it would be, then we would ask the town to you know, utilize those yourself, dollars. Ask yourself. Well, we would well, need to vote with, yeah. with yeah. we would have so, to vote alongside another committee. I'm sorry, are not, you not according to the article and how you described it last week, you were trying to make it so that we didn't have to come and have a joint vote with the select board. Right. And were you asking, in the absence of this article, like, are you asking what we currently yeah, would have in here? I would have, <laughs> yeah. Right now, if for some reason we had insufficient school choice and we had an unanticipated expense in special education, what would the steps be? I'm just trying to, is that what you were asking? Yeah, I mean, we, we would never, um, <coughs> spend down our mm -hmm. our school choice to zero, mm -hmm. right? We would, if we would go to the town first, is that what would, I mean? Well, your policy indicates that you have a floor on that. The town is, I'm their designee, but it's the it's town's fiscal and legal responsibility to account for all special education costs for all residents, whether they go to our schools or not, age three to 21. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the town can't renege on that financial obligation, mm -hmm. although the machinations that you go through are going through a town meeting vote. But ultimately, um, the, it, it has to be paid. That's a requirement of federal law, and it's a town's obligation. So we would go and request from the town. Okay. And to date, have we had to go to the town and request? Not since I've been here. But perhaps I'm not, I'm not aware of us ever having to do that. Okay. Yeah, but but if we had this fund, we could choose a committee to expend dollars from this fund for those unique specialists. Instead of um, dipping into more than we wanted to out of school choice. I think that's all part of this is to. Um, a question as to whether we would still retain the amount of school choice that we retain for our policy, or if the ask is to re-examine our policy, retain less school choice, fund more out of school choice towards the budget, knowing that we have, say, 100000 set aside in this account, that we know, well, then we have some wiggle room, can we fund 100000 more out of our school choice, adjust our policy to be less than 50% or whatever it is, and, um, hope that we don't have to use this fund that's sitting there. But the part that concerns me is that we don't know how this would be replenished. So this is for fiscal year 19. So now if we're adjusting our policy for our floor of our school choice and a year down the road, two years down the road, whatever it may be, we can't replenish, then what we revisit our policies again. We have to build up our school choice again to a sufficient amount. Do we put ourselves into a problem in the future? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I would rather not affect the change the policy at all, keep, and just have it as a continue to be fiscally responsible, reliant on ourselves for those um, increases. And um, <coughs> if there was a a uh, emergency carve out, then have that as a backup plan, but not to change policy. So if that was how we proceeded, if we had the combination of current policy and this stabilization account, I'm hearing that we have about $40,000 of school choice money, roughly, that's what you said, that 307 <coughs> we have to retain, 344 we have less than four. Yeah, I'm going to say less than four. So about, so you have about 3,200. 3,000 flat. So we have about 3,000 extra of school choice money we can spend towards the budget while still ret retaining our current policy. Is that where the ask to basically spend down to our policy? Yeah. Well, we don't need to be doing that. We need to be having more revenue coming in. Yeah. Right. I, I, I know that our.
our retained amount has gotten lower and lower every year. True. Um, but no, we have not dipped below that. And can I just <coughs> just to say, this is why we want to have the discussion. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, yeah. this to come across as some, so we're, we're trying to affect some sort of, you know, swap here um, to put anybody in a, in a, in a worse position. I, I think what we're trying to do is figure out a cooper cooperative way to work with you and open-minded to other ideas, but we worry when we think about what keeps everybody up at night. We see the school choice balance. We know how it's being used. Um, we know, I think from the presentations, the challenges facing the schools. You know the challenges on the broader town that we're all facing. Um, the more wild swings and uncertainty that we can take out of all of the, the budgets, the better. So again, we're just trying to figure out a way to do that. Okay. So again, any, and that's, that's why David wanted to bring it to you so that you could have this discussion Maybe come either come back with a hell no, or you know point counterpoint, whatever. Yeah, if the people have a better idea, I'm hmm? happy to hear it. This is my my first blush at this one. I think the larger context, though, where we're having this discussion is, is if you go back as many as five, six, seven, eight years ago uh, under. The Don and Moyer administration the schools came to us and said we have some real funding problems. You need to help us out. And the, the town over a two-year period stepped up to that challenge. I think that was eight hundred thousand dollars plus that we had to add to the budget that we didn't hadn't really planned for. And we've had to step up our game with respect to OPEP. We've had to step up our game with respect to public safety, both police and fire. Uh, certainly, there's some buildings that. Are causing a lot of head and fines right now. Um, you know, so in that kind of a context, multi-year context, budgets are becoming tighter. And in an effort to help mitigate risk, manage these budgets, and increase accuracy <coughs> in budgeting, this is one proposal, not the only possible proposal, to help you out uh, to do your job. We appreciate that. Um, one question about the law, knowing the, the comment about we wouldn't be doing this under this uh, chapter 40, section 13E. What, I guess, what law would apply in this and what per relative percentage would we have to take into account? Okay. So since we're making this up on our own, <coughs> and we're just <coughs> municipal law, financial law, uh, and we wouldn't be beholden to the percentages that we've been talking about. That would not be a factor here. Except that whenever you're talking about uh, uh, special stabilization funds, there are percentages, that ceilings uh, whereby uh, you can't put in more money than a certain X percent. But that level is so high up, I can't even remember what it is. So it can't be, I won't even say, some percentage of the overall operating budget, which you which would be many millions of dollars. So okay. we've never had to worry about that part. In the research on what other towns are mm -hmm. doing, is it possible to find out whether they do it under that guideline or a different, under the, the guideline you gave to us um, in our packet? Yeah, that can certainly versus find out something else. If they are organized, what statute they work <coughs> the funds under? Uh, my money is on the fact that if it is referred to as a special education stabilization fund, that it is most likely organized under Chapter 40, Section 13. Okay. I don't think any school department attorney would ever recommend that you call something something and then not abide by the statute that's called by that name. But there's something else that is a financial yeah. stabilization I will ask if it's or what statute is organized under. Okay. Even at 2%, though, I mean, if, you're, if you do it under this law, you can't. It's $160,000, right? It's the net school spending. So just, just to be clear, Heather had articulated a construction about, and picked up on your comment about uh, ways to reduce the school budget. Is, is that how you see this operating? So we would basically set aside funds from a stabilization fund for possible SPED costs here. But would you then see a commensurate reduction in the annual funding request? 
I believe that's what we are looking for is, is instead of, uh, you know, um, right now, instead of funding you maybe the hundred, an extra $100,000, you would use 100000 of out of your school choice and we would have the reserve there for you. Mm -hmm. Which would mean we'd have to really try to Right. When do we give our opinions on this as a board by? Yeah, I think it, it. I think it's also our opinion as a board or opportunity also to discuss this with select board and full finance committee. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming the next tri board meeting. Is yeah, that I think so. Is that April fourth? Yeah. So uh, I'm just thinking about the calendar. I was going to next week send off the. Uh, uh, midweek, I was going to send the whole warrant off to council for review. Um, we need to post no later than April 26th. Right. And job. we can always pass over this if it's. Yeah, 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 or yeah. defer to the fall town meeting. It sounds like it would just a tri board and have a conversation <coughs> and have a conversation with select board. The next, if the school committee is to vote, you don't have to vote not to do something, we'd only vote if you're going to do something. I'll include it then at your regularly scheduled school committee meeting in April. That's the vote for the committee. Thank you for thinking creatively. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I'm always around if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. or an increase of $158,000. Um, we um, have applied additional school choice money because that, those figures, um, to part of what we're discussing now, um, we have a, a, a special education cost that we are going to incur for all of next year, um, even though we anticipate that we would not be. But the timing of, of some of the, the changes for um, a particular family, the law is clear that, that it is cost that we will put in our budget for next year. Um, and so April 1st is the magic line in terms of move in, move out, and what school districts are responsible for. If a, if a Hadley resident moves to another town prior to April 1st, that town picks up all costs associated with programming. If uh, a resident moves after April 1st, the town of Hadley continues to pay those costs for in the following fiscal year. So um, some information, our information was updated around special education, which is why um, you see a change in the summary sheet of applying more school choice than we had originally uh, indicated to the finance subcommittee. However, the local contribution is uh, now down at roughly 134, which represents a 1.93% increase over um, last fiscal year. The instructions we were given, as you know, was to provide a level service budget. Um, and we started our initial level service with teachers. We asked teachers all the time, what is it that you need to do your work well? And our initial um, requests came in the email that David received from us in January at roughly a $216,000 increase. We did paring down, went before finance subcommittee that came down to $158,000 increase. We're now at a 134 for local contribution, again, which represents um, a local contribution increase of 1.93 and total budget increase of 2.09. As the summary indicates, all of our bargaining units have been settled for the next three fiscal years. And um, we um, created a level service budget as, as directed. And I'll say again, I'm. I'm happy to say that a level services budget for a school department is coming in at, at below 2%. That's the information we have currently. So a question. Because mm -hmm. Molly's here. Yes. I could ask you about <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's just coming. <laughs> um, it, 
so our instructions were to provide a level service budget, but I know at the tri board meeting, um, you had indicated that we came in over what the town had asked us to do, which going back, um, David had indicated it was a level funded budget. Yeah, and I thought not, uh, you did not come in over what the town asked. Um, but the point I was making was the number, I was trying to hone in on what was the number that David kept in the budget. I call it the roll up, you know, mm -hmm. once all the departments come in or whatever. And at that time, I think that he didn't have the school department figure, so he was starting with the level funded, which was, you know, whatever we gave you last year. And he was starting to do some work on these articles in anticipation of having further discussion, so it was an unknown. Mm -hmm. What I just wanted to be clear on is right, and so what happens is, you know, the, the roll-up occurs, the town administrator presents the select board with a balanced budget, so David did that, but part of the balancing was not to put in the figure that you came up with, and I, I want to say it's $178,000, $180,000. What he summary. received, what he received from us in January, was a two hundred and sixteen thousand dollar increase. But then that reduced, right? To one fifty eight. Now, and that's the FinCom was one fifty eight. One fifty. Okay. Um, so but the the budget document that was created, as you just indicated, had level funding from eighteen to nineteen in the budget that went to the select board. Right. For so, the school department. So that's typically not the final budget. So what what's happened now? The stage that we're at is that has now gone to the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee is doing all of their interviewing, and, and I was there the night that, that you presented. Mm -hmm. um, they were clearly seemed to react favorably to what you had presented, mm -hmm. but reacting favorably to everybody's presentations mm -hmm. and then the reality of going to town meeting with a balanced budget are two different things. So right now, I'm aware of the fact that there's a $158,000 differential in the school <coughs> item. I think there are a couple of other departments with much smaller differences, but they're certainly arguing to have those added back in. Uh, we have a wild card right now we're dealing with in terms of the ambulance service. We're in negotiations with the town of Amherst right now, but we don't even have a number from them. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty sure it's not the number that's in the current budget. Of course, anything I'm saying, you know the numbers are going up, they're not going down. Um, we've been working very hard to see what we can squeeze out on the revenue side. The reason I said that, Heather, was I just didn't want there to be any um, anybody being lulled into a sense of complacency right now that we're good to go for town meeting. There's still a lot of, of yeah. work to do, and we've got to figure out where we're going to get these monies. So that, that's why I was just trying to be clear. I didn't want there to be any... Oh, no, I was glad yeah. you were clear because yeah. um, it helped us to understand, you know, what the rolled up view was that, that was being examined and where the, the difference lies. Yeah. Um, and plus, I think we vote on our budget yeah. next month. Next month is the public hearing of the budget. <coughs> and I'm very grateful you brought that up. Honestly, I had no idea. I had no idea that the school department budget was level funded from 18 to 19. And if the, if the select board were to determine that that's what they wanted to proceed, that that's the direction they wanted to take. I think it's also important for the public to understand sure. that level funded means cuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It means cuts. Right. Yeah. Layoffs. So that that's important for people to understand. Right. And again, so so nobody is recommending that we stay there right now, but we also don't have an answer to where the funding is coming from. So that's what I'm just. We're still in a state of um, flux. Okay. And so with the new um, assumptions that are in our budget packet today, mm -hmm. the difference that we've got is 133,802, is that 134, correct? 134, okay. I think it's also important for the public to know that um, we're losing a lot in those grants. So yeah. it, it's not, yeah. it, it's things beyond our control that we're mm -hmm. losing funding in. Mm -hmm. That loss is accounted for in this picture right here. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In the 134, the loss of grants, although there still is one unknown that we bring up on the back of the sheet of Title IIA. Now, now we optimistically budgeted Title I and Title IIA with roughly a $4,500 uh, increase. And um, there is a chance that Title IIA may even go away. Um, I did provide 
FinCon saw the presentation with a hundred roughly, let's say, hundred fifty nine thousand uh, dollar increase from FY eighteen to FY nineteen in local contribution. FinCon, you're seeing this summary right now. Um, I'm I'm not sure until I heard, if I were able to hear from Title Two A, I I would want to see if we could get information on that title grant before the April before the April and then and and finalizing that number. Okay. And of course, the thing that should go to the public <coughs> is the question about circuit breaker reimbursement still hasn't been decided. Mm -hmm. So is there anything, uh, I mean, you've presented then the additional uh, tuition expense that mm -hmm. we need to account for. Anything else that you haven't mentioned as far as the unknowns or possibles? That so the unknowns remain, and for, again, the viewing public, as they weren't necessarily at, at the finance subcommittee, I'll just run through those again. So um, grant funding. <coughs> Title Two A, which could be discontinued, that would be a grant uh, reduction in grant funds of roughly thirteen thousand dollars. Our reimbursement rate for circuit breaker, that could be a pleasant surprise. We're budgeting that at sixty-five percent. That could go as high as seventy-five percent. Our cost estimates in special education are based on current IEPs. Remember that date I told you, April first. Mm -hmm. So it's we we have the rest of the month where um, things could happen. Also, um, any student that is in Department of Children and Families custody, DCF has the authority to make unilateral placements. It's not subject to team decision making, and that includes placements that could pass along cost to districts. We uh, have we anticipate 37 students going to uh, Smith Vocational in total, not new for next year, and um, we don't have the town does not have we don't have an end date for applications. Um, but we're assuming, and that doesn't mean everybody who's interested is necessarily going. So we'll be closely monitoring that. The school choice estimates on the cherry sheet, again, our side um, in terms of school department budget, the things that the school department has control over, um, on, the, um, on the revenue side, um, they essentially carry over the numbers from right now. But keep in mind that those numbers include nine graduating seniors of the school choice uh, revenue of $45,000. So if no additional students came in, that cherry sheet estimation would actually be $45,000 less than that. We have now had upwards of 13 inquiries in school choice, so we are um, certainly hoping that we will if do more than even replace the students whom we will leave. Uh, more on the town side of things, the cherry sheet estimate around school choice on the sending side does the exact same thing. It just carries over Q2, quarter two estimates of school okay. choice, or quarter two actual of school choice in FY18, carries those numbers over. Do you have seniors in that as well? <coughs> Eight seniors at about $43,000. So depending if additional students choiced out, that could balance out, or the town could actually be looking at uh, at expense being less than what it currently is, is on the cherry sheet. And the same thing with charter tuitions. We know we have our current charter enrollments, which is what the estimate is based off of FY18 quarter two. And those charter enrollments include four seniors at a cost of $64,000 roughly. So again, it depends. We don't know who will go, but um, the, the cherry sheet is just that, an estimate. We don't know if those, those tuition rates are going to stay the same. The tuition rates, we do have information for charter tuition rates, although to your point, the, the base tuition for the for charter schools in general, we, we have they can estimate for us based on our current students. But if enrollments change, if different students go, remember that calculation that you had, so it depends on hence the reason. So we have one student right now at a charter school and that charter tuition is almost twenty one thousand dollars because of the reimbursement rate based on Chapter 70 funding formula. So to your point, you don't know until the children get there. Thank you for that. Anything else on the budget update for FY19? No. Okay. You have our most up-to-date <coughs> information. Yeah. Thank you, Molly, sure. for the clarification. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. Text, call, right? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thank you. Take you. care. Mr. Beck, Hopkins Program of Studies, 1819. Didn't he do this? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> it was <laughs> so, it was so, so good though. We brought it back. All <laughs> so popular last month. All that's in there. Um, in terms of again coming because we have not put together we're doing course registration a little bit differently this year that um, our family and consumer science teacher uh, obviously our electives department chair has a pretty significant number of people who aren't in a vertical trajectory to provide with um, provide her with the um, updates to their course descriptions and mm -hmm. there was some professional development that's been done uh, and Mr. O'Donohue had update, updated his course descriptions and they just didn't make it into that additional approval. Even if we had, uh, I'd still be bringing this um, to make sure that that accurately reflected what, what uh, Mr. O'Donohue plans to do in the curriculum. <clears throat> and then a couple of other teachers just took the opportunity to make some corrections that are very minor. Um, so they're just, there's no new courses, there's no changes in anything in terms of credit or anything like that. Um, it's just uh, adding uh, a few words to some course descriptions for family consumer science and ninth grade health. Do we need to vote on this again? Do you think so? To approve the revision. You can still vote on it as because it hasn't gone to print as approval of the program of studies for 1819. Yeah. Any questions? Any changes? Okay. Motion to approve this uh, program of studies for 2018-2019. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Next. Um, oh, geez. Sorry. Okay. Next. Okay. Next. Decennial report. I must admit, this was brutal to read. Huh? <laughs> it was brutal to read. Surprise! Yeah. Almost hundred pages. Yeah. <laughs> Try chairing one of those teams. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> educators who go out to do this. Um, so anyways, it, it's a three-stage process. And although uh, we've gone through two of those three stages, the self-study, we just recently had our decennial visit, um, the purpose really behind the accreditation process is what comes next. And thankfully, it, it, in many cases, for a district like ours, is the least, probably the least costly and requires the most work on the part of everybody in the community. One of the things that um, we need to do uh, is, like every school, in, in order to remain accredited, we need to engage in a process of continual improvement. And so we'd be looking at uh, various reporting stages, and I'll take you through this very quickly. Um, the objectives for the review of the decennial report are specifically to identify priorities to develop targeted work plans for each recommendation. So I've included in, in your packet, you know, as just sort of as a starting point in, in my initial read, the things that I consider, at just as a principal, at, you know, in making a unilateral contribution to get things started and sort of sowing seeds, here would be the things that I would start with. Um, however, the Commission on Public Secondary Schools will also put priorities in, um, and that may include things like special progress reports, and those are things, um, there's a, a letter that's included as a sample, mm -hmm. which is a decennial report coming back with a special progress report to provide you with an example of how the Commission on Public Secondary Schools can have an impact on that um, follow-up process. The faculty, obviously, is gonna give input, um, as well as the follow-up committee, um, as well as the school committee. And uh, so that's part of the reason why I included that is I wanted to ask you for input, um, and if not tonight, I'd like to have the opportunity for you to um, email me um, so that I can share that information with the follow-up committee. So. When you're sitting there on a Sunday and, and you don't really have a lot to do and the first thing that comes to your mind is, I want to grab that 132-page document <laughs> that those nice folks wrote and uh, I'm going to share my thoughts with Brian so that he can share it with his faculty. Um, the accreditation process is a 10-year process. So a school receives the decennial report. Uh, we have five years to complete the report and commission on public secondary schools highlighted recommendations over the course of those five years. Um, the standard progress report, uh, progress reports that are submitted by every school are submitted at the two-year and the five-year marks in that accreditation process. So that the commission, even if they're not requiring specials, they don't want schools to become complacent. They want to make sure that they can see that schools are still making progress. Um, the suggested progress is for about one-third of the recommendations be, to be completed by the two-year progress report. 
and that every year we have to submit what's called an an annual information report that includes substantive change. For example, if say, you know, we had a massive reduction in positions or, you know, something happened to the building or something like that, we would have to uh, include that in the substantive, substantive change report. Every report that we get back from CPSS <coughs> provides our accreditation status, either accre continued accreditation, continued accreditation with warning in identified standards, and those come with specials, um, or continued accreditation to show cause for probation. For us, our timeline, we reviewed, um, our report was reviewed by CPSS last weekend at their meeting. Um, the report of the CPSS review should be returned to us. Typically, it's four to five weeks before CPSS gets the reports back to the schools after their most recent meetings. Um, and decennials can, can take you know, upwards of four weeks, whereas schools that are just looking for a one item special progress report, they can get back to them very quickly. Um, and any special progress reports as is included in the letter, I would anticipate for us that we would be including our updated core values, beliefs, and learning expectations as part of a special progress report. Um, I attended a follow-up seminar last Friday, uh, March 16th, with Eric Sednick and Deb Lauser, um, who will assist me in, in putting together a follow-up committee. And uh, the roles of the follow-up committee are included in that letter, and that's just an item that we took up from that um, from that seminar, <clears throat> and then the um, the follow-up committee will review the school's response to each report, um, and a faculty member or community member or a parent, um, somebody other than me, will also sign off on our written responses that we provide to CPSS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, are there any uh, questions in general on the on the process? No. And uh, for each of the recommendations in the report, there are really only four responses that a school can give, um, which is uh, completed, in progress, or um, no action or reject it. And so it's, it's typically um, one of the first two, either completed or in progress. And there are certainly schools that at the five-year mark, you know, still are likely to have one or two items that are still in progress and um, they'll move them on to the decennial typically unless some of those things are really at the heart of what uh, has caused a, a school to struggle and not necessarily make improvements in the meantime. So um, just a question, so the three options, completed in progress and re rejected, those are um, qualifiers that we use to respond? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so for, for a particular item, um, yeah. you know, uh, there's a particular recommendation in the report, uh, complete the development of school-wide learning expectations with a targeted level of m um, measurable um, achievement mm -hmm. and um, so let's say that comes in as a special progress report yeah that's something that by the end of this school year uh, with the work that we're doing currently and I'll, I'll add this in here that we should be able to respond to that um, by providing them with an actual copy of the document and saying completed completed okay mm -hmm. got it so and then for next year in that process they might ask for the tools to measure it we'd respond in progress and they would probably respond by sending us a one item special progress report to say, give us the time, give us your work plans to provide us an idea of when you're going to have this part of the process finished. And so they, they, they apply pressure. Um, having been unserved on the commission for six years, um, they've pared things down to really target special progress reports to m a minimal number of items, understanding that in particular schools have an enormous amount of pressure to go through improvement processes that are put on them by the state, mm -hmm. um, uh, local organizations, uh, pressures to, I mean, across New England, groups and organizations, uh, uh, municipalities are, are combining to regionalize, and all of those different pressures 
um, really required NIAS to take a look at the improvement process that they have in place really has to have targeted leverage. Right. And so, you know, we'd be looking at special progress reports from time to time as would any other school, but it, you know, those specials won't be things that will inundate our work. It will allow the CPSS to have an impact on, on where our improvement priorities are going to be placed in those work plans. So in thinking about like, our retreat this summer and, and in focusing on um, this aspect of the district vision and goals and, and long-term planning, if we were to try to think of, okay, at what point do we want to say these things are completed or in progress or if there are any that are rejected, what's kind of the, the time frame then that we're working with? Is that three or five years? It's a total of five years, five. really. Yeah, and it's, it's looking at the five-year progress report mm -hmm. is when you really want to have them done and, and by that time if there are some things that just aren't worth pursuing for the district um, that are going to have a minimal impact on education they are tolerant of uh, you know some of those recommendations being classified as no action or even rejected I've done that in two and five-year progress reports in, in, in serving on uh, prior follow-up committees but um, for the most part most schools are able to work their way through that five-year process and then uh, you're beginning the process of engaging in a self-study. By that time, the school should have. In, we, this this school has had a regular um, a regular cycle of review of its core values, expectations, um, or mission and expectations, as it had been in the past, and and uh, its its uh, academic and civic and social learning expectations about every five years. So, even though we'll have these developed, um, we you know, we need to stick to a cycle of, of re really regular review of yeah. those as a school community, so. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, yep. thank you. Thanks. All right, and you're still in depth, my Okay. Okay, HA school <laughs> strategy and improvement plan update. We, we talked about that. No, he has a couple no. things for you, sorry. He uh, didn't talk about that. No, nope. sorry. School strategy and improvement plan update. So this is just a brief update on uh, progress that's been made. Um, deeply appreciative of the leadership, uh, in particular of so many members of the faculty and um, so many students in the school who have made contributions, um, as well as Dr. McKenzie and those who have provided, those who have gone out and done a significant amount of professional development, uh, in particular. Uh, in the areas of social justice um, and, and equity and, and helping us to address those issues and concerns. Um, in particular, in focusing on what we anticipate again will, will likely be a special progress report item um, that the faculty this year, we had um, developed two, um, a civic and a social uh, expectation from last year that were similar to what had previously existed uh, in the school's school-wide learning expectations. We began uh, this year by looking at some research uh, and asking the question about how it aligned with our, our current expectations, and then subsequently asking each educator to start with themselves. What is it that you value most about education? What, do you, what, what to you are the most important parts of what we do here at school? So asking people to start with their own core values. Um, just so that we could see what commonalities we might have collectively as a faculty and staff. Uh, students, we facilitated discussions, the entire faculty facilitated discussions, um, where students were able to give some anecdotal information in the first response, you know, what is it that they value about education, uh, was the question. Um, and there were some prompts to rephrase that for students. We gave them a glossary and so forth of terms. Um, and then we gave them a, a list of items and asked them to just, rather than rank order them, you know, or pick one through three, just try to check off you know, two, three, four of the phrases in the following categories that matter to them. And so we provided those results, um, and this will go back to the faculty as well. Uh, this was compiled by school council um, about a month ago. So we did this in February. And so these are ready to review as well. And so category one really is um, the things that we look at that should drive our culture or be reflected in every aspect of our culture. And you can see that students overwhelmingly um, selected respect. Mm -hmm. That uh, what educators should commit to, students also overwhelmingly selected travel and field trips. <laughs> 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 um, 
but also clearly identified real world connections, opportunities to pursue personal interests, working with peers. And then um, one of the ones that's interesting is looking at what students identified as uh, the most important commitments that they make as students. Because typically statements of core values, you ask contingency groups to make commitments to or to identify things that they believe they should commit to. And it was really impressive to see that students really identified um, some really sharp things in here uh, really consistently. That students need to effectively manage time, which will be an important consideration as we go into having some dialogue Friday with them after viewing the movie Screenagers. Um, that students should be motivated to do well was the second, uh, or sorry, was third, and the second choice was uh, that they should have clear plans and goals for their future. So to have an entire student body identify those things in consensus as the top three items, it's pretty clear that there's, there's solid peer pressure here in the school where we can make those as statements or we can take those student statements and convert them into something that we can demonstrate or show students in our postings and, and hopefully in our culture and in our climate that these are things that students should be living by and um, carrying forth as examples. And then uh, in just a couple of days, uh, we have two years of notes from um, prior forums that we held uh, in preparation for the self-study, which faculty still has uh, <coughs> and used in the prior process. And then um, I'll be putting out a survey, which I believe should be released on Friday on Google Forms, specifically focused for parents on questions about rigor and academic learning expectations that they have so that we can do something similar, although much more pared down, that we did with students and try to get parent feedback specifically on what the expectations that they have for their students in terms of um, their academic experiences. When would you be targeting that parent outreach? I'm hoping to release it Thursday or Friday of okay. this week because I'd like to get it into the hands, leave it open for a little bit more than a week, maybe about 10 days, and then with Google Forms, it, you know, we can compile it very quickly. Um, to be able to get it into the hands of faculty for our professional development day when, when then we would have all of the input that we need, focus back on our research, look back at our own individual core values, um, and hopefully you know, be in a position on that day to make some decisions and put together a draft for voting uh, at the faculty level. Um, is there any chance that we could see a copy of those questions that you asked about the parents? Because as we're drafting our um, survey up for parents, we want to try to avoid um, survey fatigue and repetitive re repetition of information and stuff. Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, when are you guys looking to put out your survey? Um, we don't really have it a It will be probably till yet. May, because um, okay. we'll need to bring Friday. questions. So yeah. it won't be Friday. <laughs> yeah. right. so, we'll you, be Friday. so Keith, you'll have it in advance, uh, uh, because it, it will be released. But again, it's going to be very targeted. It's not going to be a comprehensive survey. Um, we want it to be something that's quick, but thoughtful. Uh, just in, in looking at you know, I'd, I'd like to put out in the email, here's our, here are our current academic, civic, and social expectations, and we need to revise, in particular, our academic expectations. That's not that we're not going to ask for um, input on our civic and social expectations, but our specific focus is we want to hear from parents about what they think um, the school should be focusing on, at least over the next five to ten years, in terms of what we should have as school-wide ac academic expectations. So it'll focus there. Um, I'd probably be looking at something from 10 to, I think it's 12 questions right now. Um, and so I'm hopeful that it's going to be very quick. And well, so if that's something that you could integrate into what you have as well. We can well, avoid, they can avoid it. So we'll make sure that they get a copy of the survey. Yes, exactly. So we'll, okay. give you the, so, yeah. Yeah. so we'll give you the data is what I mean. Because yeah. when and, you and say it's focused questions. and targeted, you're saying the questions, not necessarily the recipients, right? right. The recipients. Well, the recipients are only going to be aging parents. Right. Yep. Yeah. So okay. Just Hopkins. Tara and Keith yep. would need it. They're also the survey committee, and they don't have children in AHA, so they okay. need an actual yep. copy of okay. the survey. Okay. Great. Exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank and you. so, if for some reason, you know, we've we've gone past it. By the time we get to April, it should be compiled. So that might be one of those things that you asked me to bring to the meeting or forward it to you guys beforehand. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, other things that uh, have really been completed, and this is a, a whole group of people. This really. Um, started with student leadership, faculty leadership, um, and uh, in, in working with the superintendent uh, and other members of the faculty that we held in October assembly to put in place a faculty reporting network 
um, from the prior year in that assembly with students while we release some information and some documents and put the put an initial reporting form in place um, we also did some follow-up on how that form uh, and, and the process could be best expressed to students um, so that they were able to identify um, people with whom they felt comfortable if for some reason, I mean, not everybody feels comfortable going and seeing their teacher specifically. Not everybody feels comfortable going and seeing me. Not everybody feels comfortable going and seeing a counselor that maybe they've only seen up in front of their classroom and they haven't had personal conversation. Um, so we identified some people who at each level of the school, school-wide, high school and middle school, um, are people who are known to be identified by other students as being people that any student in the school could feel comfortable going to see um, to help them fill out a report of something. And that report can either be um, anonymous or uh, you know, in, in really dealing with any kind of issues that they see in terms of harassment, bullying, really to cultivate bystandership and ensure that students aren't out there really holding on to information that they should be bringing forward uh, to help us improve the climate and culture of the school and make sure that students are supported. And then after that, after those revisions were done, we held another assembly in February where we clearly posted all of those around the building and sent out a, a second email to students so that they have an understanding of how to access that network. Um, and so that, you know, that process is completed and will be ongoing from the perspective of constant revision. In terms of social justice and equity, there's a long list here that's in the summary of, of work that's been done, and that's this, just this year. Um, we had great present, a, a great presentation from um, Basilia Zeno uh, regarding the educating our students on the Syrian refugee crisis, and um, then uh, connected with I am Malala, that uh, we had guest speakers from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Chad, and. Kazakhstan that who came in to speak with our students about what education is like in other parts of the world, which was really eye-opening for our students. They asked, I thought, excellent questions. I thought they did a great job of, of helping these people to feel comfortable uh, coming in and, and just sharing something with us that our, our, many of our students really don't have any understanding of. And that was followed um, in December with the Diversity Club's Eat for Education um, program tied to uh, the school-wide read I am Malala. And then uh, on January 20th, in between the boys and girls varsity basketball games on Saturday, um, the hashtag recognize sexism campaign um, was unveiled. Uh, just recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had an end of day activity schedule where we engaged with students in uh, dialogue as faculty around um, issues of equity in general. Although it was designed by the Gender Equity Club, we covered topics that included um, not just sexism, but issues of racism, uh, discrimination, um, stereotyping, and um, you know, I, I thought the certainly I, my group was in here, and I had a, I had a really nice time, and was really pleased with the group of seventh graders that I had, and how really thoughtful and knowledgeable they are about quite a few things, um, and it, it was actually pretty inspiring for me to have a, a sense that they have a much stronger understanding than I would have given them credit for, um, and then. Uh, Amy Lanham has uh, put together an Issues of Gender Equity Lunch Series, hosted for both middle school and, and high school students separately on a voluntary basis. Um, and you can see the summary in, in, your, uh, in your packet of the topics, that there's, one, there's a different one each week for the month of March. <clears throat> and then right now, we are tentatively planning on April 30th and May 21st as gender equity activities to uh, roll out further the social norms marketing campaign um, to assist in the culture of the school. Uh, another item from the um, school improvement plan is uh, grade level progress monitoring teams um, that this is implemented. Um, last year, well, over the last two years, that the middle school has met once a week uh, one week they do seventh grade, one week they do eighth grade. So every other week they meet to discuss students that, uh, about whom they might have concerns, um, to help identify supports for those students. Um, and uh, it, that model really has been effectively translated to the high school. And although the meetings are held after school, one of the things that we found is we need to find a way to cultivate a higher level of teacher participation 
in those. There are a, a number of meetings that had been scheduled already at the start of the school year. Well, we kept them on Wednesday. That's not to say that there couldn't be a 504 meeting or an IEP meeting that might happen that day. So it's going to take some creative scheduling for us to make sure it's not just uh, Angie Cullen and our lead guidance counselor, our school psychologists and, and other folks there, but that we have many more teachers who are able to participate in that process because the contributions that we get from everybody there in the room are really valuable uh, in terms of helping students move forward and um, overcome some of the challenges that they have. And then the final item uh, that I wanted to share with you is um, focusing on um, making improvements in middle school mathematics. Uh, and really the reason you ask you know, why, why the focus on middle school mathematics has to do uh, w as much as anything with our, our MCAS scores in the middle school over the last couple of years. Uh, we looked at myself, um, the eighth grade math teacher and the seventh grade math teacher really have done a great job over the last couple of years at, at taking those results and, and turning them into what I think are meaningful um, changes. Um, basically taking a look at the 2017 results that we had a lower than desired uh, student growth percentile with only 39% of our students in grades um, in grade 7 uh, meeting or exceeding expectations in the 8th grade last year. Student growth percentile was 36 with students meeting or only 51% of students meeting or exceeding those expectations. Um, by contrast in grade 10 uh, a 62.5 student growth percentile um, with students in the categories of proficient or advanced at 80 percent. So can I add one clarifying yep. point here just to remember remember grade 7 and 8 are next generation MCAT but the state anticipated a 50-50 split on that so eighth grade was closer to what the state anticipated certainly we want our students to go beyond the state expectation, but I want to put that in grade 10 is what's called legacy MCAS. So you are also comparing two different MCASs. And then so in uh, 2016 results, grade 7 had a median student growth percentile of 54 with 66% of the students meeting or exceeding expectations. Grade 8, um, 19 for a student growth percentile with only 38% of the students meeting or exceeding expectations. And again, by contrast, grade 10, uh, 61.5 as a median student growth percentile, with 85% of the students in proficient or advanced. And so for the, for the math teachers, they really wanted to focus on well, what is it that we can do uh, to turn these scores uh, around, to improve student growth. Um, and so we've taken a look at a, a number of things over the course of the year. The primary sources that we started with were um, these teachers took a really close look and did a th really thorough analysis of three years worth of MCAS results, broke them down not just by strand but also by problem type, um, as well as um, the concepts that were being addressed in each of those types of questions. They went further to begin the process of aligning their course unit exams, so by the time they finish a unit, their, their course exams are also aligned with um, with MCAS questions, MCAS testing. Um, and then over the, this is the second year where we've implemented quarterly cumulative exams. And part of the reason that we wanted to do that was we wanted some, we wanted to have an idea of how things are being, how, how math concepts are being retained. So something is taught in a unit in September. By the time they get to November, how well do students remember that? In particular, if it's not a foundation skill that's applied in the later unit, it might not come until December. Um, it really informs the teacher as to what they might do better in terms of reinforcing that. Uh, math being a language, we want to make sure that students have an opportunity to be able to speak that language as frequently as possible. And so if something's taught as a discrete unit and it's not necessarily reinforced, we can identify the impact of that well before we get to a, a hugely cumulative exam like the MCAS exam, which comes later on in May. So it's really provided us with good data. Um, and those, uh, the teachers worked really hard to align those exams with, um, those quarterly exams with the previous three years worth of MCAS questions. Um, and also had taken the time to look at our um, online IXL program, which gives us immediate feedback in mathematics. And uh, they also took a look at that current IXL data. 
So one of the things that they did this year that was very different than in prior years was they made pretty substantial adjustments in curriculum, in particular with regard to pacing. Um, in both the seventh and eighth grade, coming to the realization that we could move our students harder and faster uh, without necessarily burying them so much in work, they reduced the amount of time at the beginning of the year that they spent on review activities from the prior year. And what that allowed us to be able to do was to sink faster into the current curriculum and move faster through that. So pacing over the course of this year has been better just by starting off a little bit more rapidly than they have in prior school years. Um, again, the development of the quarterly exams um, and uh, I think the big thing this year that we hope will serve students, the school, and families well is the development of every single student um, to this point in the school year, which is almost three quarters of the way through the school year. There is enough data for each of the teachers to have created one of these for every student in grade seven and every student in grade eight, which identifies those strands that we saw in prior testing years um, that these, this current group of students needs more support in. And so what they did was create individual IXL profiles. And it starts off, if I'm not mistaken, the first six in grade eight are uh, graduating class-wise. So the identified across the entire eighth grade. Um, and then the remaining items in your sample are individual to this particular student as identified as strands. Uh, and again, they're aligned with the MCAS test, they're aligned with our curriculum, they're aligned with our unit exams. And um, it provides us with a huge number of advantages. Um, they set an achievement target of, of, of 80% and the primary reason is to give students an opportunity when they get a question wrong on IXL, it drops their percentage. It almost works a little bit like a video game where you need to achieve that 80% score but it gets increasingly sophisticated as you go along. <coughs> For the most part, until you get to complex open response questions, um, the MCAS tests and uh, you really need to get up toward um, pre-AP and advanced placement exams to get up, up above the types of questions that exist above 80%. And so for IXL, that 80% target puts us in a good range where we can confidently say that a student has a, a much better understanding uh, and has had sufficient practice in that concept that they should do far better uh, on these exams and have had enough reinforcement to be better prepared for the MCAS test. Um, it provides extensive practice and the, the, the reason that we used IXL really is twofold. Um, provides extensive practice in that computer-based testing format, so our students are going to be tested in ELA, math, and science this year in grades 7 and 8 in the computer-based testing format. So this gives them exactly the same type of format as they see. They answer the question. Um, in this particular case, what's different is it tells them whether they got it right or wrong, um, but it moves them on to the next question. So it's very similar to the format. Um, and then for us, as students are working on it, we get a, a immediate data on what the student is doing. And that allows us, again, to continue the process of making adjustments to instruction. I know in, in um, Mr. Green's class, if he sees that a student is struggling on it as he, as he monitored it, he can actually see their score going down. That's, he'll get up and, and, and go see the student and ask them, intervene immediately in the classroom. And you can see that in the accreditation report, that individual type of intervention and support from our students because of the size of our school and the quality of the relationships that our faculty has with our kids is a huge strength. So pulling all of those things together and, and combining it with something that, you know, over the course of a couple of years is really thoughtful and really well aligned, I'm hopeful will yield, you know, results for our, our students this year in the middle school. Thank you. Good, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Student Council reports. The ATS Student Council, I just have something to, up, uh, to give you an update on. They finished their playground equipment survey. <coughs> a lot of effort into this. It's a big love of swings. <laughs> so we are taking, no, no, they made their recommendations and they are swings and pumps, sufficient pumps on the equipment cart. This is a big problem. Squishy balls are a huge problem. <laughs> and they don't work. So they're going to put plenty of pumps on the cart and they are going to recommend swings and the PTO is willing to investigate um, what kind of swings they might be able to invest in. That's my update. There's a swing committee. 
<laughs> there, well, there may be. There okay. may be a swing. <laughs> there, there will be rank voting to determine yes. the swings. I've got swings. a stable playground. Yeah. All right. Uh, personal report. And you have two long-term substitutes in your personnel report, and that's the only thing to report. Okay. Chris, business manager report. Okay. So we had a number of transfers. You will notice that um, when you look at the account balances and the percent used, uh, we had substantially higher numbers in a lot of these areas. Those have been reduced. A lot of the overages have been zeroed out. Um, for lack of a better term, and uh, we will continue to do this. Basically, at this point, we are shuffling money within the budget to just offset certain accounts that are over, um, and we have some accounts that are obviously short, or, or the expenses are short, so we're just moving that money over. Um, if I need to move any of accounts that require your approval, which would be moving things from, say, a supply line to a salary line, I will bring them forward so far none of my transfers have required that approval um, we did notice a glitch actually um, it, it's a good news glitch but um, when I was reviewing all of the open purchase orders a lot of times we have purchase orders for the entire year so say for something like legal services we take the full amount of our contract with Fred and we just every month we send the bill uh, and we take that off of the open PO. And so I was reviewing those with Mary and I asked her, why are these payments not coming off of the purchase order that's opened? And she said, well, they are. And she held out the purchase order and there, every month she writes, you know, the, the date the payment was made and the amount. And when we looked in the um, accounting software, it did show that same purchase order number. Yet for some reason, the amount encumbered did not reduce. So as a result, what we're showing is we're showing the expense for the account. And what's supposed to happen is when you post an expense, it reduces the amount of the open purchase order. This was not the case. I, I've emailed them to ask them to take a look at it. Um, so I mean, the good news about this is that it's actually showing that we have less money than we do, which it's certainly showing it better to show that than to show, you know, make us think we have more money and then all of a sudden hit us with it. Um, it's only in a couple of purchase orders. It, it wasn't across the board or anything, which is even more strange. So we're, um, we've asked them to take a look at it and, um, you know, I will let you know what was found, but we did, um, I think electricity was another one where we've spent about, I think we spent $58,000 so far this year. That's from July through last mm -hmm. week. And somehow we still have $83,000 encumbered mm -hmm. for the last three or four months of the year. Obviously, it seems highly unlikely we're going to use that much. So um, that was another one where, for whatever reason, it just did not reduce the amount. So uh, we'll be chasing those down, obviously, and uh, you know, making the corrections. Um, it, that's going to be something mm -hmm. that we can't do ourselves. We're going to need them to WebEx in take a look at it and, and they're going to have to make some kind of a correction, you know, in the software programming wise, yeah. it gets more than anything else. Yeah. So So the percent used here will be adjusted when that error that problem in the accounting software is changed. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Right, so as the encumbrance goes down or actually mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It is adjusted the percent the used should should increase. That's right. So okay. that yep. should be different than just coming reports. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we just, of course, I printed all of these off, and then I came over here, and they're still sitting in the printer. So <laughs> I'm kind of going, going off of uh, the 178 page package we have here. Uh, page um, 163 is yes, the grant. <laughs> just arrived there. Um, so this is the grant report. As you can see, um, a substantial number of the grants have now been used in full, uh, which is certainly. Our goal again this, these were part of the transfers if you remember a few months back I said that we'd be kind of mm -hmm. monthly making transfers to things like the 240 grant um, rather than hit them all at once that has now been fully utilized circuit breaker we have a little more um, that we'll be able to use but basically we'd like to carry over pretty close to this amount 
Um, so that's that's pretty much fully utilized as well. Um, you have something like that Title 2A at the top of the page. It's $23 remaining. Um, Title 1 and Title 2A, at, uh, usually in March, um, will send us either a revised amount upward or downward. We were the lucky recipients of an additional $23 in that grant. And so, uh, you know, that will now be applied as well. And we, I think we got, it was $68 in Title I. So that, again, will be applied. We should um, probably schedule a meeting to decide Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we have lots of time, too. Okay. I'm sure it'll take a while. Um, Pumps and yes. Pumps and swings. Yes, yes. yes. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> <coughs> a swing right, may or may not be. Uh, so, are, are there any questions about the grant accounts? No. Okay. Uh, oh, let me just. <laughs> Lunch. Oh, oh, please. please. All right. Once again, uh, further explanation I, I is needed. <laughs> uh, yes. All right. Let's see. Yes. All right. Just a glaring list Annie, of you want to take this one? <laughs> I, no, I'm just going to wait for an explanation. With optimism you know, and patience. I have to, I say, have to walk out. Well, <laughs> Optimism and patience. Do tell. You know, this killed me. It does every month. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, again, the, the payments have been coming later, for whatever reason, from the state, um, which means that the February payment, I, I think, might not have even been received yet. I know the January payment was received. Well, I, I'm, oh. it's not posted in here, but... I don't even know if it's been received yet. Mm -hmm. And I know the January payment was received on February 28th. So for whatever reason, they're really slow in that. Be that as it may, you know, every year I typically transfer typically around $30,000 of mm -hmm. uh, the food services director's salary back into the local budget. I cannot tell you that we won't be doing that again because I certainly believe even, you know, if we applied the, the revenues from the state that would put us back in the positive, but it's not a healthy, robust account balance. You can see in July we had nineteen thousand uh, dollars. You know, we wouldn't be sitting on that in July if it wasn't for the thirty thousand dollar transfer that was done last year. So, um, you know, I'll be expecting to do another one of those. I like to wait till June. I have to say, I'm tempted to do it now just to erase that negative, so that um, <laughs> someone next to me will. You should sit with that. Are we going to be looking at an increase? Excuse me? Are we going to be looking at an increase again of, uh, of the, the lunch prices? Yeah. Um, we'll have to look into that. There's a report that we have to file yeah. with the state to show that we're keeping up with, uh, you know, basically inflation and what their idea of uh, price increases are in line with. It, we typically, we do that every year, and okay. we either need to or we don't need mm -hmm. to uh, okay. do one. So I'll contact Diane Zach. Uh, we can take care of that. Uh, the other accounts, you know, just an FYI with the athletic one, you can see the, the revolving account there has dropped from about 22000 to nine, um, And the reason for that, again, is that the scoreboard was put up in the gym. I believe that was around $11,000 itself. So, uh, you know, that's uh, certainly put a little dent in the account, although still, you know, we're, we're in good shape there. Um, that's basically all there is to really discuss. I don't know if you have any questions on that. No. No. Okay. Uh, the next item is the school air conditioning project. So there's there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that again, the prices came in um, higher than the amount of money we had. The good news is that we have enough money to do two of the three wings. Uh, and I've highlighted the low bids uh, for each portion, the electrical contractor and the general contractor. Um, the prices in the general contractor, let me, let me just do the math here quickly. No, I'm sorry, they don't, they're, they're not included in there. Um, but we, we do have enough, um, you know, to, we'll take out Alt 1, which was doing the cafeteria, and Alt 2, was taking out the cafeteria and one of the wings. Um, so we can get a good portion of that done. I think we have around $370,000 remaining in the account. Uh, the total price would be 338000 So we're That's okay there. 
So Chris, that 338 includes what? Two, it, the electrical and the general contractor? For, yes, it does. For yeah. two wings? The general contractor's bids came in a week after, actually two weeks because we had a snow day. Um, it came in after the electrical and as an amendment to the whole bid process, when we opened the electrical bids, we saw who was the low bidder and sent out an amendment to all of the um, spec holders saying, all right, this is your electrical contractor, so figure this into your price. Right. Um, okay. So when they submit a price, it already, they already knew who the electrical contractor would be. And uh, So how do I read this? If I, we were to do the entire, it would have been 580? That's correct, yes. So, so if we were to do the entire, then it would have been a different bidder that would have had the, the low bid. But yeah, uh, it's, it's one of those pieces that we're doing. <clears throat> that, that's exactly right. Yeah, uh, TJ Conway would have been the low bidder if we did the entire project, but because we can't do the entire project, the actual low bid for the portions that we will be doing is um, climate heating and cooling. So. so taking out the cafe is what the price in Alt 1 is? That's correct, yes. Okay. So Alt 2, so it's basically 580 minus the 91? That's right, yes. It winds up being what we chose on? Or no, I'm sorry, Alt 2 minus 150 for taking a wing off. Right. So yes. okay. is, will it be two wings and the cafeteria? Is that how, how do I? We'll, so what's we will do two wings. And we'll take off the cafeteria and one wing. Yeah. So, so the bid award, but yeah. So the the amount, the first column is everything. And your recommendation is to go with climate heating and cooling. That's correct. And to do two wings only. Right. Is there that's, an obvious yeah. two wings to do? I um, think there is one that's hot, generally hotter. I don't believe so. The, the goal is to get the wing um, that has the preschool, basically the younger kids in it. Um, I guess not that the older kids get any, uh, or, or stay any cooler or anything, but you know, they're just, the younger you are, you, you can't really have it as hot. And so that's, that's the goal. After that, it, it, it's not really that one wing is any hotter than the other, you know, they're all, they all get sun different times of day. Yeah, I suppose. Well, don't they use that preschool wing for summer programs too? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's where they usually post. So which one? Which is that? We're taking is off this and this. By this and this, you mean? Oh, alt. sorry. That's okay. Uh, we're taking off Alt One and Alt Two. Off of the amount, which results in three thirty-eight. Yes. Which is the lowest bid? Yeah. Which needs our four hundred? What is our the the amount for that would be three thirty eight and change. So right. we've used about roughly thirty thousand dollars for the diagram and all of the plans to be drawn up um, and the bid specs to be written, all of that. Uh, so you know we still have obviously enough money to do that. I did ask them because it, you know to, to finish the job at this point we'd obviously have to go again for additional funding at, at some point in the future and that supplemental amount would be just to be clear if would be a what what amount the, the amount we'd need to get yeah to, to go uh, it would to be about to say 200 and or less close than 250. To well if we went with the 550 and we have 370 left right it would be no, less than 200. But that's if we had all the money in hand, which we right, don't. Right, which we so don't. Imagine you going out again, you might get closer to the 580 bit, so it's going to be a little over 200 we, we need remaining, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if you just add the price of Alt 1 and Alt 2, right? Uh, you know, we have anywhere from, you know, you're looking at climate, Alt 1 and Alt 2 are, you know, I'd say 240,000, 241. It's then you look at TJ, TJ Conway's. Yeah, it's so much cheaper. The, it, it's odd the way they bid on these things because Alt One, you can see how the rest of them were anywhere from eighty-seven to ninety-four thousand. You know, so they're all fairly close. And that fifty-eight thousand Alt One for TJ Conway is what you know. It's it's a low amount. We would hope that if we were to go out to bid again for the next section of it. We'd like that kind of an amount bid for us, but I guess I, at Damascus, I don't understand the math. 
you deduct alt one and alt two from TJ Conway five fifty three. Mm -hmm. It's not three fifty two. Mm -hmm. So you must, there must be some other calculation. Uh, five fifty three minus one forty three is Cause about because they're, they're not taking 10. as much off. About four ten. Uh, I guess it would be, and then you take fifty eight yeah. off. Yeah. Okay. You have a bigger savings not doing the cafe with mm -hmm. the climate heating can cool versus TJ Conway. And I did have that discussion with TJ Conway. Oh, he called and asked, are you going to do the whole job or just I that amount? And I said, you know, unfortunately for him, no, we can't do the whole job, um, which he knew immediately meant that his bid was not the low bid for what we were going to do. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. All right. So, <coughs> what's the timing on that? That's a summer project. Right? It's definitely a summer project. I was told it would it would take a couple of months to do. So it's going to be one of those things where, basically, right when school gets out, mm -hmm. they need to get in here and get this going. I have a question. Does it make sense to um, proceed forward with uh, a recommendation at this juncture that would not include the cafe, but then? Um, you know, the project's starting in the summertime anyways. Um, is, is there some way to make up that shortfall between now and then and decide in the summer that, hey, while we have the whole crew out there, economies of scale suggest that it makes sense to do, do it right the first time rather than invite everybody out again and have... The problem with that... Ahead. Well, there, there's, I guess there's two... There's a challenge of actually you know, getting the funding for it. But the problem is that it would then switch the low bid yeah, from climate heating and cooling to TJ Conway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, you, you couldn't just make that switch, obviously, you know, on the fly in the summer because... Because in the lowest, your vote, which I didn't give you the absolute correct language, your vote, you have to recommend whomever you recommend mm -hmm. as the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then if you did that, as Chris just said, climate heating is not the lowest responsive and responsible. Mm -hmm. So you have to do it exactly like that, even if that feels kind of interesting. We couldn't seek out that other 58 and award part to one part to the other? Boy, I don't even know. That's a, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a question, good question, actually. <laughs> um, are there words, it's how it's much? kind of the inverse, right, of mm -hmm. pricing just the cafe, which yeah. we, oh, I see. we priced not doing the cafe. We're <laughs> backing that out, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, okay. uh, right now we're looking at, we probably have, you know, roughly twenty-five to $30,000 remaining in the funds we have. Um, so we would still have to you know, come up with more. The other side, of course, is that I just don't know. When they took out $58,000, you know, as part of their overall bid, I don't know if that necessarily means that if they came back in to just do that, right. they would be $58,000. Yeah, right. um, Which is why I'm wondering what the incremental cost would be to do it right the first time. Because uh, bringing out a crew a whole lot <coughs> of time Absolutely. is going to cost a whole lot more. Yeah. yeah. It's probably two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and if we have thirty thousand, so right. we're going to have to go back to the so town. I'm and ask wondering if we're being short-sighted by leaving it off, or you know what? Well, the question is, yeah. do we want to go to the town and get on the town mm -hmm. warrant for and the, the day? And the, the difference between what we have and what we would need is two hundred two ten. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, d I guess it would be uh, it would be five fifty three, and so we'd be almost two about two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Okay. I know this is nowhere near. This is probably insanity. I guess I would just put it out there that. Tri board could think about it. Uh, is this an example of a one time capital cost instead of a recurring cost that um, the excess stabilization might be good to put to good use on? Could, could there, are there stabilization funds that exist for uh, capital needs? Mm -hmm. uh, is that making sense when mm -hmm. we talked about that there are some stabilization funds for capital and equipment? Is there an existing stabilization fund mm -hmm. for capital mm -hmm. that could be funded at a higher level that this would fit into? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm that out there because that statement was made. Is that something that could be asked and answered before we would have to vote on who to give this contract to? <coughs> uh, what did our bid doc say about award? Did it say in the RFP? It, it you know? did. I, I think we actually have time to do it. I, I think it was uh, like, I think it was three months actually that we had. 
but I, I'll have to I'll have to go back through and look. Um, have you talked to David but, about these bits? I'm just curious if he has any ideas. About how well, I, I talked to him after the first batch because right. you know, of course, we had gone to bid before and we just had it as an all right. all areas done, and you know, we were just nowhere near yeah. um, where we needed to be. So that's a good question. I guess the most important thing is if if you recall in the in the request for bid in the RFB document, if we if it is that we if if the expectation was that prices would hold fast for 90 days, and um, then the school committee would have time to vote it at the April meeting. We could certainly show them to David and even contact the IG's office. Although I think we. Could, I can't wrap my head around how you would, what you stated, which is logical, but I just can't wrap my head around how it would match with procurement laws. I'm trying to wrap my head around how one keeps a building cool, but then the biggest, most sizable part mm -hmm. of the building is hot, and how that does not um, pose Jack. some energy <laughs> <laughs> some challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I'm nice. sure it does. I mean, I mean you know, the, the cafeteria doesn't get used a lot. Well, it, it does during the school year, though. I mean, really, the whole building doesn't get used a lot during well, the summer. Well, this is the so. whole reason why we're putting this in, is for the school year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that cafeteria door could be open. I mean, which, uh, yeah, I just, mm -hmm. it seems uh, It seems like it could um, maybe bite us in the long run mm -hmm. if we, um, uh, in terms of electricity usage for mm -hmm. right. maintaining this air conditioning system. I'm trying to find it now. Mm -hmm. We definitely are going to have to increase our electricity budget for next year. Well, I like the idea of asking about um, whether there are stabilization funds for capital needs that would cover doing the whole project. Mm -hmm. It's a different it would maybe be good to know what is, I mean, if, if we had to go with two wings only, mm -hmm. understanding what that means by way of usage over the summer months where those two wings might be cooled, mm -hmm. like are we doing ourselves a disservice because there's a lot of usage of the cafe during those, I, I just have no idea. Mm -hmm or isolate, like, can you close that off so that you aren't, you know, like cooling your house and leaving the door open, basically. Yeah. And was the plan to use the air conditioning during the summer months in all of those wings? Uh, not in all of those wings. We would make sure that we ran our special education programs in a wing, in a single wing. There's plenty of classrooms. The special education programs are very small, so. And for the most part, they're already operating classrooms that are using their own intended air conditioners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we so do that, can we wait until April then? Or you're checking? So I'm, I'm going to look, okay. yeah. And you can go on to talk about your school committee reports, and okay. we'll find in the bid document um, where it indicates the, the amount of time that the, when we must award. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, yeah, let's move to school committee reports and discussion. Uh, so family and community <coughs> engagement survey. Um, thank you all for getting back to me. I did send you guys an email that Keith and Tara will be heading that up um, for this round, which will be our, yes, thank you. I, it'll be our third survey, mm -hmm. I think. That's right. Um, and I guess a question about timing, Annie, mm -hmm. is, we can, uh, as I mentioned in the email, get you those questions from the last survey so that you can have a chance to review mm -hmm. those, cross-reference them with what Brian was mentioning. Do you want to bring a first pass-through to the April meeting to discuss? Right here, so mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's too soon. It's I can, it's up to the committee. I'll put any. I'll be prepared to have anything you would like. And remind and me of when we were looking to have that report out in general. We were looking for May or June. Yeah, usually I think we'd want to deploy the survey in May, in May. Yeah. so that we could discuss the results in, in June, June right. or July and have them inform our the summer time. retreat. Mm -hmm. right. the general so the first pass-through could kind of be like a first read with policies where um, 
you bring, you know, well, this is the direction we're thinking of going, and mm -hmm. this is what's aligned, this is what we think can go, these are the gaps where we think we want to add things. Um, does it require a vote, the this final right. questions? So it could be uh, you bring it in April, and it's on us to get you feedback by a certain date after that mm -hmm. so that you're able to deploy it in May. I think it's totally little. Yeah. Okay. And so, would we have Brian's Hopkins questions mm -hmm. by then? Too? Yeah, it sounds like um, you'll have them this week or next week at the latest. Uh, so Mary and I can call our files. <laughs> I know. I think the last one you did most of that. Yes. It's on. Point. Is it? Is it on file? It must be. It was through yes. survey. Yeah. Meeting. So yes. we still. It'd still be there. It's the same. Yeah. Account. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, policy. Let's see. Yes. So we did that. <laughs> we did. Uh, if I, I, I have a question for y'all. What yeah. you have is not only the annual review, but every policy that was reviewed. You see all the date that says uh, your first reading tonight. Now I didn't fill because you really would have gone over the edge with um, the packet. Would have been a thousand pages long. <laughs> 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 quick. Very. Um, so what I can do, because there goes first reading, second reading, you don't adopt until April. Uh, if you want me to, I can include every single one that's track changes. The reason that I did not is you do have a subcommittee that goes through them. One could argue it kind of defeats the purpose of the subcommittee. If then the entire committee goes through um, every single document, I can put them in there, that's fine. The revisions are listed here. I will do whatever you like or refrain from putting uh, hard copies of every single one in this packet. Um, and I would just like to say that the majority of the revisions <coughs> were minor language revisions or to update um, things for uh, um, two mask standards. And I don't feel like there was anything um, that was really big though that we want to have a larger discussion on. Correct me if I'm wrong, Heather. No, I, I agree with you. Um, in addition to language changes and bringing them kind of more current, current language, we also had some uh, Fred's legal input mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on um, a couple of the policies too, just in, in part of that, um, between Fred and the um, nurse. Nurse leader. Mm -hmm. Pretty much uh, going with, you know, predominantly some of the legal language, but getting at the spirit of the nurse leader's comments. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, trying to think if there was anything. The only, the only ones I could, that I could possibly think <laughs> of were the final two in here, the naming of facilities and the memorials. Mm -hmm. yes. um, those would be the only two things that I could think of, um, especially with the, the namings of the facilities could um, have some impact on the fields um, and the memorials. Um, um, a departure from current. Yeah, departure uh, from current policy. policy. And so I'm absolutely happy to um, include them all. I'm perfectly happy to do that. I just wanted to ask, and I was sensitive of the fact that we would never get the entire thing scanned in if I did it this time. <laughs> I think I'd prefer to see sure. the track changes. I sure. would too. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, it would make it easier for us to quickly scan and understand and stay current mm -hmm. on top of what those policy changes were. Yeah. I agree. So if you send those out um, outside of this meeting, can mm -hmm. that still be considered a first read and we come back in April with yeah. questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because your first read is even your first or, read is even just the revision, reviewing the revision. Oh, so okay. you don't and then you'll have a yes, you're perfectly fine. You can do your so even adoption April, in April. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if and if we need to move that off by a month because sure. there's still outstanding questions. Absolutely. We're, we're okay. Schedule one. Yep. Okay. Just so I understand, is that something that is sent out? So the first reading, it's sent out in advance, though, not our typical school committee packet? It's, no, it typically just goes to the school, in the school committee, committee packet. packet. Yeah. But I'm happy to send it out. I can ask uh, Sue to send it out this week. Is it Monday? It's Monday. Yeah, because I think it would be what we saw mm -hmm. if if we made any changes, they were minor. Right. Like, I think you saw one where there was language that hadn't terminology mm -hmm. that all been Yeah, but did that didn't. Term. Term. Yeah. Just given the sheer number <laughs> yeah. that are being addressed, it'd be good just to have them. Sure. <coughs> so you may, um, I assume that you're only. I'm only sending you those that have any revisions. Committee review revised. So you see on the second page, just so you know, the committee reviewed all of these, but there were no revisions. Mm -hmm. So I will, won't include. I think that's those fair. are on okay. a different yeah. side. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Okay. okay. Perfect. Happy to okay. do that. That makes sense. Um, next one is Triboard. I think we've 
beat that one to death. <laughs> um, all due respect. But no, I we did go to the tri board meeting. I think the only thing we didn't talk about um, so far tonight is the discussion that was around those um, subgroups that met to uh, talk about the three positions, uh, HR, IT, and finance. finance. Yes, that's right. And so um, there was continued discussion at the last tri board meeting about what's happening with whether the town has a recommendation moving forward on those three positions. There was dialogue around um, select board looking for well have we really identified the need have we identified the job descriptions have we identified the reporting structures um, before we seek out the funding which would be have to be really sort of an override for those three positions had it, which the finance committee had presented that as an idea um, have we thought this all the way through as to how these positions would fit in given the current structure of the government and the reporting lines for them. So that was a lot of the dialogue. There was, um, I guess, really a, a question about, uh, the comment was made about sharing of resources for finance, mm -hmm. that uh, the perception was we had not given an answer on whether or not we're open to that. Um, so, you know, I don't think that that's, I don't think it's that we've dodged the question or not given an answer. I think it's, um, I don't know that we've necessarily been at the table as part of those subgroup discussions. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but it's essentially sharing across between the town and the schools. Right, so this evening um, you will vote as to uh, whether or not you want to <coughs> go out for a request for proposals for business services, uh, the management solution, the company that Chris works for, is that contract ends June 30th of this year. So we do uh, what we did in 2015 when I was here. You, uh, I wrote an RFP. We went <coughs> to, to uh, brought in a request for proposals. We received proposals, and TMS was the proposal that um, the school committee deemed the most qualified. Um, so this isn't a bid, it's a proposal. The most qual qualified proposer. So. Certainly the town, uh, I already sent David a draft copy of the RFP because I need a letter from David Nixon. He's the chief procurement officer for the town. Normally when Chris does bids, he talks with David. Obviously Chris can't do the RFP for business services. Um, and I gave him a copy of that. The town could decide that they too wanted to participate in some sort of proposal for business services. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, I, they could certainly choose to participate in that request for services that the school department is doing, that the school committee is doing. Um, yeah. So, so the, is the decision that they could they could join the same request for proposal, have their own request for proposal? They could ask or to join. To, they could ask to say. Um, you know, they could say, we'd like you to change the following elements because we'd like to be included, just like when you do a joint mm -hmm. bid for trash bags. I'm sorry, there was no analogy. <laughs> 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 I was just thinking sure. of things you go out for bid for. thing that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. When you go out to bid for custodial, uh, custodial yeah. supplies. So a lot of people can join on the bid. We have a lot of joint bids like that. So they may say, all right, you know, we need these services too, so we're going to have to change some of what we're looking for because it would reflect right now the proposal reads this is for Hadley Public Schools, the Hadley School Committee is requesting these services. That could change to the Town of Hadley and Hadley School Committee are requesting these services. Okay, so I have a worry. Mm -hmm. um, my worry is would adding the, um, the specific and nuanced needs of a town change the type of vendor that would bid on I guess it's not a bid, but proposed mm -hmm. to, um, and therefore it wouldn't be optimized for the understanding of a school's business versus a town's business. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. It does. It's a great question. But it I could don't know possibly. Whether, you know, agencies like like yours, Chris, are you know nimble to be able to. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's a you know town mm -hmm. or a 
Yeah, I think I can't. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I mean, I don't want anybody to, to call out that there was an unfair uh, yeah. proposal practice. But we so. should also say the town hasn't shown any interest in doing that, right? Uh, Apparently, it's discussed at tribe. What the town has shown interest in, at, at least um, the finance committee, is establishing a full time employee position, position right. which I could see where maybe the impact on our bid process is the length of time that we enter into an agreement with. But the, the length of time as part of that RFP. <coughs> length of time? Um, how long the contract is for whoever's bidding on this thing, whoever's proposing to us their services. If we're saying it's a one-year contract because after a year, there's going to be an FTE in the town that would take this on. And what, uh, how would it work if we enter into a year, um, a year contract? And then the town brings in a person to take over those duties. What right. would we still be on the hook for right. the balance? I think that's what we should coordinate with, with David. Because they're talking about going to the town for an override to well, find these positions. So one the thing the committee would like to. Mm -hmm. The select board uh, is. Well, I think that they're they're discussing whether or not they can entertain that um, and add it to the warrant. Mm -hmm. So one thing to be aware of is that the school, a school business official is appointed by the school committee. So it's one of the positions that you appoint at the recommendation of the superintendent, but ultimately you either agree with the superintendent's recommendation or you say we're withholding our approval. And the superintendent can't hire without that agreement from the school committee. A, a finance director for the town is not the same as that. Yeah, I, I would be worried. Having seen what it's like to be operating the school without a, a capable and knowledgeable business mm -hmm. position, I would be worried um, about hastily <coughs> um, pulling the trigger on any switch. Um, if the town were to go down that road and um, bring on someone who was highly capable, then we could start working with that individual and see if, in fact, they were highly capable for the school. Mm -hmm. I would want some kind of overlap and transition to actually see whether that met the needs. But by no means would I uh, would I say that it's a fait accompli, like right. that it, of course it's going to meet our needs. And it's too important a position for us to um, predict at this juncture. So it's almost like um, we know we need to renew service or go out mm -hmm. and acquire services. If the town wants to go on to that, that's great. If they do get to a point where they hire an FTE, that um, after appointing that or whether that's part of their job description, we understand what that what the skill set of that position would be in working with us, then we could slowly get to know and yeah. make sure and and then transition transition it off yeah and currently we don't even know if that's going to be going to the table because exactly. there still is a divide between what finance, finance is recommending versus what the select board is recommending right. so yeah. i'm not sure it would that's be who of us to could say going that, that route right. when we're up for so I like the idea of at least giving um, through david the option of look we're going out to bid anyways Mm -hmm. Or we're seeking proposals anyways. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Do you want to piggyback on that? And maybe it's not. What is it? Three years? Uh, maybe it's not three years, but maybe it's two years. I, I don't want to go back year after year. Right. Um, right. We need. It's going to take them at least a year to get it together, and then we're going to want at least a half a year to transition knowledge and just make sure that these that the new service is capable of what we need. Um, so, I think that we should be conservative about that transition and say to your proposal. Does that make sense? Like uh, just adjusting the length of time with that consideration of, you know, there, this may be on the horizon. I'm, sir, I'm, I will adjust the proposal as however you'd like me to. And what so is it currently? Day three? Three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or have um, some, or some language in there that it could like it, if there's the, if this position's coming on after a transition period, yeah, I wonder. Yeah. The contracts would change circumstances. And Usually, the whoever the um, 
payer is is winds up paying some kind of penalty if they're going to end before mm -hmm. the full term of the contract, mm -hmm. unless there was some kind of you know issue that is covered within the contract that you could under justifiable reasons. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so is that the assumption this finance person, if, if employed, would also do the school's finances? That's the goal. Shared the shared services. Shared now there was also mention though of potentially going through. Um, and I don't know enough about this. Was it HCOG, <coughs> or the Council, Hampshire Council, Council of Government, whether or not there are services available through that that would help and cover this too? To and honestly, I don't know whether that's more HR than it is finance. And I would say when I met with David to ask some questions about the school department budget, he presented to me that this was not about shared services with the schools. That in fact these positions that they were looking through HCOG and to share these kinds of services with other towns so that two municipalities would share a finance director mm -hmm. right. rather than um, the school department and um, the town. Okay. Well, let's, um, I mean, then maybe it seems pretty to do what we planned on doing and mm -hmm. offer through David, the opportunity to get on, to be part of that. Right. Yeah. I'll just, I don't know, good. keep it at three years so we don't have to do it again anytime yeah. soon. I agree. Yes. Okay. okay. So we need to vote on this? Yeah, so in this case, if you would just make RFP a motion to, services. yeah, to um, do an RFP for school business services for <coughs> FY19, the term of FY19 through FY21. Motion to um, go out for a proposal for business services from FY19 to FY21. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Fields. Paul. Uh, big thanks to Florence Bank for their generous $5,000 donation for the Fields. So our fundraising campaign is continuing. Uh, we will be sending out a contact on the GoFundMe site so as folks can donate online and we'll be doing more uh, campaigning and outreach. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Okay. All right. CES. Yes. So um, since I was last uh, reporting out on CES, uh, they have a board meeting every other month. That's so the next one is this Wednesday. Um, and at that time I should have a whole lot more uh, information and update for you. Um, but I've noticed that they held a big social justice conference. Mm -hmm. They were holding all kinds of workshops and programming. And um, they continue to um, provide great services to Hadley. Yeah. Um, so two of our teachers went to that conference. I facilitated a, uh, one of the groups at that conference. It was excellent. Great. Excellent job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm curious when you go to this meeting, one of the things that they featured recently on the Today Show, of all mm -hmm. things, was uh, cyber civics. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about, remember, like digital literacy. I guess now it's moved to, okay, cyber civics in terms of um, the, the breadth of content that's covered that with mm -hmm. that, not just, you know, using uh, digital platforms correct, you know, in the in the right way, but also learning about the impact of its use, the decision making, the, you know, the digital permanence, and I just, I thought that was pretty cool, and I don't know whether there's any kind of talk about, you mentioned social justice, but I, right. this seemed like another new strand. Absolutely. I would love it if you wouldn't mind sending me what you saw. Yeah. Um, because they are so that. open to suggestions. In fact, I think you might recall that it was right after the November election that we suggested that they consider holding something around um, detection of fake news and how to authenticate different sources. They ended up holding a whole program for uh, librarians at all of their member districts mm -hmm. and that ended up being something that Hadley utilized in lots of other districts and that is direct impact to our students yeah. so um, let's get that idea to them because I'm sure if they haven't thought about it they would love to hear it. I'll send you that. Great okay uh, action items so approval of the AP warrant submitted in March. Yep. 
I need a motion to approve. Motion to approve the AP warrants submitted in March. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All abstain. <laughs> Approval of warrants submitted in March. Uh, motion. Motion uh, to approve the warrants submitted in March 2018. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 And approval of the minutes from February 26, 2018. Any questions or revisions? Okay. Is there a motion? We move to approve the minutes of the February 26, 2018 meeting. All in favor? Second. 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 <laughs> Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Are the program of studies? For program of studies, we, we did. did. Yeah. 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 Air conditioning did. We're We've got questions. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wait on that. Uh, so the air conditioning bid, we will have to uh, schedule our, if you want it to come back, the prices are good for, what did that say? 30 days from opening? Without Sundays, or Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays, so. 30 business days? <clears throat> yeah, so it would oh, basically. Does somebody have an electronic calendar? On um, I seat? looked, and it was April 23rd. What day did it open? So really, I guess, well, it was opened on. That's in here. March 12th was the general. It was the electrical, uh, but I believe the electrical already knows. You know that if the project goes forward, they're going to be it, which means thirty days, thirty business days for March twelfth would be um, April twenty third. Yeah. But that would be the date we would have to notify them by. So, in reality, April twentieth is a more realistic deadline. So you can move your school committee meeting potentially if you were, and um, just grab my calendar. Is this something that, um, based on whatever answer we get from the town, we could hold a special session just to vote on this? Oh, you can you can move your meeting. You can have two meetings. You could absolutely just have a. <coughs> yeah, you could actually hold a you know literally a five minute meeting if you wanted just to approve this. Individual item. Yeah. I mean, I could certainly email David tonight. I'm just, I'm just thinking if our meeting out. is supposed to be the 23rd, anyways, mm -hmm. and the week prior is school break, mm -hmm. um, the week prior to that is the week of the election, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know that we want to, I don't know whether we want to move our regular meeting or just say, well, we'll commit to holding a Special. I'd be more apt to commit to the special. Well, okay, special great. Session. Can we find a um, date that works now so we can get it posted so I don't forget to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how will that work? That's, um, we would, if in fact we could, wait, is this a meeting contingent upon whether or not we can get additional funds to do the whole project? Yeah. Yeah, yes. so I think there's a couple of things that you're asking us to find out. One is, um, to find out, one is that we're going to go to David. Am I correct on this? And yes. see if is there a way. So part of it is this conversation in Triboard. Is there a way to close the gap on um, doing the entire job? Mm -hmm. Correct. That's ultimately correct. what we're asking. Is there a way in the short term, without going to uh, with without going to town meeting necessarily. I, I mean, if they have existing stabilization funds for capital, I think this is what yes. you're asking. It might have to be a warrant article to move money. I don't know whether mm -hmm. it would need to be, Maybe, yeah. to move money from a stabilization fund. Or to utilize so that, it, for, <coughs> I, I just don't know. Or to just vote to do the project without the capital. Right. So basically we need to find out if we can get that, if, 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 if we, we can, can get that, gap. close that gap Before within the, exactly. And so we'll have to have a meet. We'll have to have a meeting regardless. That's to vote. what I was getting yeah. right yeah. because we have to vote this forward. Yeah. Yes, I believe that tri board would be on Wednesday the fourth. The fourth, right? So maybe we can meet on the. I don't know whether Monday the ninth would work, or if we want to meet like Thursday the fifth, just to schedule uh, just to hold. Mm -hmm. So well, I can do Thursday the fifth if. Um, 
Yeah, I can I can still email David tonight. Okay. Just to kind of that would be get good. the thought process yeah. rolling. So there'll be one um, agenda item on that. And is that does everybody I'm just gonna ask you, does everybody get out of work at that time? I mean you can meet earlier if you'd like, but you certainly don't have to. Five fifteen is the earliest I think. Okay, so we can skip five thirty. That's not a problem. Okay. Or would the morning work for anybody or is that no. I, We have um, a wonderful idea that's our art teachers across the district. You have a, a student activities fund for Hopkins Academy. They have a Hopkins Academy student activity fund. Ms. Brain, uh, Ms. Sousey, Mr. Bartlett, and I'm forgetting somebody, Mr. Richards. So your art and music teachers at both campuses would like to schedule an arts event. They would like to um, bring people from the community in. They would like to charge admission. The purpose of this particular fundraiser is to raise money for um, a recorder that um, a student with one arm would be able to use in music. Um, but they'd like to be able to do this fundraiser going forward. So we're asking to create, since we only have a student activity fund for, um, for Hopkins Academy, um, we'd like to create a student activity fund that's just district-wide for the arts. And that's where they would be doing their fundraising. I love this idea. Yes. Can we just motion to approve? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Is there a second? Yes, second. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Let me get all that. I'm sorry. I'm texting Sue to say, don't forget to post this. Okay, okay. first. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody seconded it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pick a name. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Policies in April, and that's done. Okay. Policies. We did that. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, RFP for school business services. We just talked about that. Um, okay. Next regular meeting date, then we'll. Uh, does that meeting date of April 23rd work for everybody for the regular okay. meeting? We'll be on a plane to get that day. Okay. Um, otherwise? It's good for so April 23rd. So mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, perfect. It is the day before we go to Detroit for the Robotics World Championship. Ooh, that's the exciting. Hadley FTC team. That's that's yes. Make sure we get the really clean. All right. Yeah. Cool. <coughs> Can I just add one more thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I just noticed it on here, the water quality and drinking fountains. Oh, yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. So we have um, all of the classroom drinking fountains lined up to be replaced with lead-free components. Um, during April vacation so those will all be done and we are also installing really just well I guess there's two reasons financial and time we're installing one new fountain in the hallway that will have the bottle filler oh, as well sweet. Sweet. Oh, that's so that is um, and does it have the filter mm -hmm. um, I believe it does that's yes great. yeah in here that's elementary yeah. that would be at elementary we also have Two places so far designated at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. oh, that's right. And I think we have four places designated at the elementary school. For the bottle filler. Where you could easily put them, you know, because you need electricity there as well. Oh, yeah. um, so, you know, Jeff and I will walk the building just that's to uh, see if there's any. So you just got to factor in the filter costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks for doing that. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, we are going to need to stay quickly for an exec yeah, session and also in April. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, yeah, the April meeting, you talked about moving it to the cafe? Yes, please. Oh, we're shaking it up. Yeah, we're, we're going up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so just to not have to rearrange <laughs> just the Just the crowds. <laughs> <laughs> we got to make Yes. When um, is our 
public hearing on the budget. April 23rd. It is. Yeah. Okay. So that's part of our meeting. Mm -hmm. Got it. So uh, we'll do, uh, both do the budget. And, and, uh, yep. All right. Budget presentation is April 23rd. Mm -hmm. and we'll be in the cafe. Yep. Okay. So we'll need to um, have somebody motion um, regarding the executive session. It's the language is on the front of the agenda under number two, but we will not reconvene. In not reconvening. Session. You don't need deployment of security and personnel or devices. It's um, just the first part up to, to non-union personnel. Right. Motion to go into executive session to conduct collective bargaining sessions for contract negotiations with non-union personnel and to discuss the deployment of security personnel or devices or strategies with respect thereto. I've determined an open meeting will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and we will not reconvene an open session. Okay, is there a second? Second. And we'll do a roll call. Mm -hmm. uh, Keith? Aye. Tara? Yes. Mara? Paul? No. Heather? Yes. Okay. Uh, meeting adjourned. <coughs> we'll go into executive session. Yeah, I don't know if the camera's still